Okay, we are live on YouTube. Okay, thank you. We are currently reading over the public comment that was submitted by Mr. Eccles. Um, most give, I guess, one more minute and then we'll move forward. So just like our um, public comment, if we were in person, we don't necessarily interact with the document. It just gives us more information to uh, the nature and the topic of the public comment. So about one more minute and then we'll move forward on our agenda. Has everyone had the opportunity to read through the November public comment? Does anybody need a little bit more time? And we'll definitely have a little bit more uh, wait time and response time with technology today. Okay, moving forward. Um, Kelly, do we have a state board update? I have not received an update um, from Zach. I will reach out and see if he can send me one. Thank you. Okay. All right. Moving down our agenda, announcements and communication update. It has been a very quick month. Um, I do not have a um, communication um, update this month. I'm just working behind the scenes and reading up on um, a lot of the information. Are there any announcements from other board members this month? The announcements. You can just come off a of mute if you have any announcements. I I guess I can just chime in. This is more of a personal note, but um, uh, I can go ahead and announce that uh, my wife and I are expecting our first child. So. Uh, we we just found out we're having a baby girl, so. <laughs> oh, congratulations! Thank congratulations! You. Thank congratulations. you very much. That's so. great news, Sean. Congratulations! <laughs> That's a good announcement. <laughs> That's a good announcement. Yes. Always always good to share happy news. <laughs> yeah, happy news. Oh, congratulations! That's great. Thanks. All right. Any other announcements? Anyone else? It's going to be pretty hard to top that, but all right, let's keep moving down this agenda. All right, October minutes, they were included in the uh, electronic materials that were distributed by Kelly. I think they're on there we are. Um, because you got that um, materials yesterday with the amendments, does anyone need to review them again? Um, Dr. Gartland? Nope. Oh, she needs to review them. All right, let's just take two minutes to review the October uh, minutes and then we'll uh, take a motion for them. And I would propose just one uh, minor amendment to the, the October minutes uh, from with regard to the attorney general staff members present. I believe Alan Dunklow uh, was present for the last hour of the meeting uh, when I became unavailable. So um, I think he probably should be added to to the attendance if possible. Good morning. Good morning. Um, uh, to everyone, um, and of course to our chair. Um, I have one, just one slight edit. Um, the superintendent of Montgomery County Public Schools is Dr. Monifa McKnight. So I just wanted um, us to make that edit to the... Okay. Thank you. Also, this is Sandra Scordas. Um, I was not present at the meeting.
Good morning. This is Keisha Allen. I was just um, on page three after the break. Um, my first name is spelled Keisha, K-E-I-S-H-A, um, just so for consistency purposes. Any other corrections to the October minutes? Is this Roebuck's name also, is there a typo, an F instead of a C, or is that just my the way mine opened? Say that again, Ms. Wilson. Uh, Ms. Ro uh, Ms. Roebuck's name uh, in, it would, is there an F instead, or McKnight, I'm sorry, Ms., uh, is that Miss? I, I was getting the, the Monica's and I okay, was getting well, the name <laughs> confused, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I was looking for the minutes, so my, my name is R-O-E-B-U-C-K. I, I haven't, I'm trying to still find the minutes, but it's a uh, Roebuck. No, yours is right. I'm sorry. I was confusing yeah. you with the following members were absent one of our um, our uh, additional members. Oh, okay. No, she is Monica. Yes, yeah. I, I was, yep, definitely need more coffee. Thank you. I move to approve the um, um October minutes with the uh, noted typos changed. I second. This is Dr. Taylor. Thank you. All um, in favor? Good morning. I just wanted to let oh, you know. Oh, I'm go sorry. Ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. This is Peggy Pugh. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to let you know that I was designee for Dr. McKnight at the October meetings. So I was present for her. Okay. And I'm present today for her. Okay. Kelly, did we did we know that? I don't think I knew. I didn't. Only I did. I so, and just to be clear, so when a board member is absent, um, certainly like like Miss Pugh is here to to listen and um, take the information back to Dr. McKnight, but that individual um, is not able to participate in the meeting, um, may not vote or anything like that. But we will absolutely list you um, in the recognition of guests. You should be listed. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so I think we had a motion on the floor by Dr. Gartland, seconded by Dr. Taylor to approve the October minute with the corrections that were stated. So let's try our vote again. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, all opposed? Any abstentions? October minutes are approved with the corrections that were mentioned. All right. Next up, we'll have the public comment. And I believe this is the electronic public comment that Kelly sent out with the materials. Correct, Kelly, this is the other, this is, do we have this public comment or? Yes, this, okay. is, this is a public comment we discussed last month. Okay. Um, if you are looking at the electronic file, it is called 2023 Certification and PA Public Comment. It is an Excel file. And the companion of that file is a PDF um, that has a list of all of the full comments that are summarized on that spreadsheet. And the title of that Give me one second. is program approval public comment 923. If you want to have that up as well in case you need to look at the entire set of comments. Does anyone need me to share my screen or are we good looking at the paper copies? <laughs> yeah, I'd like for you to share your screen if you don't mind. Dylan, can you please give me access to share?
Dylan, are you still with us? Kelly, I will find Dylan and, and um see what the situation is. Thank you. You're welcome. So that may take a couple of minutes. So if it's okay, um, Monica, I'll go ahead and get started and I'll share as soon as I can. Sure, no problem. All right. So Kelly, can you um just because I don't rem I I feel like I might have the right document, can you say what was at the top of that document again? Um, it's the really, it's the really big one. I think I have like, but I think I have like three big ones. So I'm like, it, it's the thicker one. <laughs> it is the thinner one. The thinner one. It's okay. the thinner one. And the first entry is 8923 by Liz Zabbi. Yes. Okay. And we're on 14, correct, Kelly? Yes, ma'am. 15, 15. But, well, we stopped at 14. I'm sorry. That's what I meant. Yeah. And Melita, you may have an extra copy that isn't bolded. Think, so it's it's the copy where all the text is bolded. Right. I'm like, I had multiple copies. Okay. Okay. I got gotcha. you. And this is the program approval public comment 923? Yes. This is program approval. So this is public comment with regard to 13A0706, programs for professionally licensed personnel. Okay. I'm better. Board members, please give me grace. It's always a lot of shuffling when we're virtual and making sure you have like the right document. Okay, I am good. Um, we talked about, let, let me just refresh my memory here. We stopped here because we were talking about that, the group um, with the IHEs and the seats and it was a lot of concerns with 14. And so this is where we stopped last month. Okay, let me make sure. All right, I am I am ready. And just given by everybody else on the board, are you ready? When's all situated? All right, let's let's wrap. All righty. Okay. Okay, so starting on row 15. So we, when we stopped last month, we were in the middle of reviewing a letter that was sent by the Deans and Directors Council. Um, and that, just as a reminder, is um, a mixture of our public colleges and universities and our private colleges and universities. So in that particular letter, um, they, they provided several comments. We happen to be on line 15. And um, the comment in line 15 is uh, if it takes too long for universities to change programs to adapt to current urgent needs, we should one, reduce the time for MSDE to review program changes, two, create collaborative programs through consortia that can be offered across the state and online, and three, incentivize change with competitive state funding. Um, and so I'm going to jump over to uh, the last column, the MSDE comments. And um, my note is that the cited regulation, so the regulation that's cited here, um, and we talked about this at some point last month as well, there is a section, if you look in the middle column, C3 says at least six months before requesting program approval, a provider should notify the department of its intent to initiate the review process for a program for which there is no national content standards. So as a reminder, this is the only place in the regulations where we talk about um, timing, uh, you know, notice that type of thing. This happens to be specific for programs that are not aligned to national content standards, um, where we've called out that they need to give six months notice in advance when they would like to provide that proposal. Um, nowhere else in the regulations do we carve out a timeline. Um, we're not recommending that we carve out timeline uh, in regulation. We, we are recommending that that remain in policy. Um, my note here is that this regulation does pertain specifically to those programs where there's no national content standards. Um, and again, the approval timelines for other programs is not, is not established in these regulations. Um, also, 
I, once again, I know that we've gone over this before, but I'm going to say it again. Um, it's important to note that the review of educator preparation programs here at the State Department involves a team. It involves a team of MSDE content experts, um, literacy experts, if it is a program that is um, you know, early childhood, elementary, special ed, or ESOL. Um, it involves our program approval specialist and 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 levels of leadership. So it is a uh, robust process um, and it is extensive. And we do review every aspect of the program um, and, and we're not recommending that that change. Um, to ensure that Maryland is approving only those quality programs that will result in candidates demonstrating the knowledge and skills to enter Maryland classrooms, MSDE will continue to conduct proposal reviews in a methodical and rigorous manner. So you're going to see that comment kind of repeated throughout because there are a couple places in this document where um, the comment is that we need to shorten the timeline the time that it takes to approve programs. So that is something that we discussed last month and I, it may even come up again um, in the remaining comments. Um, the other bullet points in the comment, um, create collaborative programs through consortia that can be offered across the state. There's certainly nothing preventing that from happening uh, with these regulations. Um, incentivize change with competitive state funding. Um, these regulations are not the mechanism to discuss funding, but certainly um, nothing in these regulations would prevent that from happening. So I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, I'm just trying to, um, since it's been a month <laughs> since we first started talking about um, this particular public comment, I just wanted to make sure that I understand that this, my understanding is that this is, these are suggestions from the deans and directors councils instead of doing in state, I'm sorry, in district teacher preparation. Is that correct? That seems to be what they're saying when they say if it takes too long for universities to change programs to adapt to current urgent needs, the urgent needs to um, high, high quality teachers. Yeah, I think, yes, yes, but I think it's broader than that. I don't think it, it and I could be reading it wrong, but I don't think it's just about the industry pathway. I think in general, I'm reading that, you know, we need to reduce the time for MSDE to review program changes. Um, but yes, to answer your question, it, it kind of all flows together if you look at the letter. I tried to kind of pull out each concern so that we could discuss each of them. Thank you. Kelly, they said that you can share your screen now. Thank you. She just she just told me. I appreciate that. All right. Okay. Can you all see the spreadsheet? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. Let me make it as big as I can. We are here. Okay, thank you. Sure. Just bug me if I forget to navigate, <laughs> please. <laughs> Were there any other questions or comments with regard to this particular comment or letter in general? Because I think that was the last um, piece of the Deans and Directors Council. So I don't want to move away from that letter unless everybody is ready. Kelly, can I um, uh, jump in for a second? Sure. Sorry, did you mind? Um, okay, so when we ended, we were on 14 and we're now on 15. Each one, of course, dealt with this letter. And I want to go back to the concerns. This is kind of uh, where we left off, I think, at the last meeting. There was concerns about the industry pathway. And we're certainly continuing to still get concerns about the industry pathway. And I think it largely centers around the idea that the in-district pathway opens up a door to lower quality because there are inequities I think that's potentially there between traditional routes that are offered by higher education and what might be offered through the in-district pathway. And so Melita and I, uh, along with, um, at the time, Superintendent Chaudhary and Kelly, you were there as well. We spent quite a bit of time talking about this letter and the feedback that we got and so forth and that concern. 
Um, and Kelly, if it's all right with you and, and Melita, um, I kind of want to go over that meeting that we had. Is that okay? All right. Um, so what we discussed, and some of this we've gone through in the previous meeting, was that we could address that concern a little bit by making sure that we we put into um, potentially later the COMAR, but there'd be an agreement that there would be a review board that would be established in order to go through any of the applications that come in from the districts. And that would sort of act as gatekeepers for quality. And I think we've had that discussion. If I'm not mistaken, I think the board was, was pretty warm to that. One of the other things that we talked about is the potential of the fact that the some of that inequality might be around the fact that it, as part of the blueprint in 2025, we go to a performance-based assessment. It's a portfolio-based assessment. And schools are doing it already, but it's the ED TPA and the PPAT. And if you did an in-district pathway, that probably would not necessarily be there. If it was there, you might go through it once, but I think the suggestion was you didn't have to do it again, which kind of signaled we were a little concerned about it. And from the very beginning, when we've been looking through this, the superintendent met with us, talked to us about the fact that most states are running away from these portfolio-based assessments, and we're running toward them. And he used that line repeatedly. And I think that's one of the areas where that inequality between an in-district pathway and what we're about to require uh, higher ed to do starts to come in. And those concerns about ed TPA and, and PPAT largely are that they don't seem to, when studies are done, be a predictor of teacher quality. They also seem to stand in the way of minority groups coming into the profession as well. And the passage rate on those kinds of things is, is pretty disproportionate. And I know Melita has been looking through the studies. I've been looking through them. Higher Ed's been sending us a number of things. And it does raise an enormous level of concern to me. Um, you know, if you're going to do an in-district pathway and you're going to do a regular pathway, the Ed TPA seems to be one of those places where it's going to become very unequal. And I think the concerns higher ed are raising are valid, um, especially the more I look at how troublesome I think these assessments are. So anyway, what we had talked about was one of the ways to maybe address this is make a recommendation that this part of the blueprint be revised or taken out. And one of the ways that we might be able to do that, and, and you know, Melita and I spoke to um, Superintendent Chaudhary about this, um, was perhaps we could draft a letter um, that would go to the legislature addressing concerns that we have um, about these exams and and also suggesting that serious um, consideration be given to eliminating them. Dr. Chaudhary, or I'm sorry, Superintendent Chaudhary was uh, in favor of that. I've chatted with several people in higher ed. I think they were in favor of that. Um, and the idea was perhaps if through communication, uh, maybe Melita could see if the state board was interested in drafting a similar letter, that that might be a very powerful thing. And that could potentially remove some of these, um, I think, inequalities between what could be these two programs for um, certification, the, the in-district and the, the traditional pathway. So I just throw that out um, for conversation because it was something that we talked about. To me, I think it's a good idea. Um, now, I, I will tell you, I think in the history of our board, we have not generally taken a stance on legislative issues and so forth, although we have weighed in occasionally. Um, but it is something our board has the purview to do. We've certainly given testimony um, in Annapolis. I've done that. I think Melita probably has as well, um, just on how the board feels about certain things. So this might be something that we take a, that we decide we need to take a stand on. Um, and I again, I'm, I would throw that out now, of course, more for the discussion of the board. And I really would look forward to hearing any feedback that our colleagues in higher ed have. Okay, so I do remember this from virtual meetings. Can you put, if you want to speak on this, please put in a chat so I can keep track. We're not sitting around the table. And with um, Kelly sharing her screen, I don't have the Brady Bunch format. And so I don't wanna miss um, anyone's opportunity to speak on the topic. Oh, thank you, Kelly. So I see Dr. Zebley um, wants to speak or has a comment or a question. Thanks, Melita. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Wonderful. I was having some technology issues this morning, so I wanted to make sure that I was okay. <laughs> um, I want to echo some of the concerns that I heard from, from Darren when he was speaking about your meeting, um, but I do want to put it out there uh, that I would be in support of, of that letter 
um, and working with the state board. However, I do want to make sure that if we are citing studies or if we are citing research in that letter, um, you know, as a researcher, I want to make sure we've done a thorough literature review and that we've attached those studies or referenced them in that letter to make sure that those items are available uh, for those who would receive it. So I just wanted to make that request if that's possible. And Kelly, if I can jump in again, or Melita, um, one of the things we talked about, and I agree with that 100%, um, I've been looking at some some studies and so forth, and, and folks have sent me more things. One of the things I think that we have in place now that would cause us to maybe not need those assessments is because we're about to begin operating under a completely different system that is, I think, far more rigorous if we pass these regs than we had before. There are now going to be year-long internships. We're just finishing up a very rigorous and I think high quality induction program that was also part of the blueprint. Um, and we've also got our own accreditation. We have Maryland accreditation that calls for constant checks to see how students are doing. So to say that you're going to now straddle students with these a very expensive tests, particularly if they go through the traditional pathway, seems almost counterproductive. We're already gathering this kind of information. I just wanted to throw that in. So I think if we did a letter, yes, I think there'd have to be a very thorough review of literature, but I think we also have to say, here's why we think there are very rigorous gatekeepers in place that would, would cause us to maybe not need that, uh, those, those um, portfolio-based assessments. Then I think you'd have a much more even playing field if we went forward with an in-district pathway, because one, you'd have gatekeepers in place, um, and a lot of those gatekeepers would come from higher ed, so the quality would have to be there. Um, and then secondly, the playing field would be a little bit more even because the way we're um, preparing students and assessing them would be much more similar and it wouldn't be so in, uh, inequitable. All right, and I'm sorry, I've talked a lot, so I'll, I'll okay. be quiet. Dr. Listening. Shockley, um, I saw that your hand was raised and then you put it down. Did you still have a comment? I just wanted to share that um, uh, our coach, Darren, did sh share the sentiments of the letter from the Dancing Directors Group, um, and in particular, the concerns about the inequity that would exist um, if there was this other pathway that did not require um, the same kind of, you know, just accountability. Uh, there was a comment made in the last meeting about skepticism. I'm not sure if that skepticism um, occurred in, in August, but there is no <laughs> uh, skepticism. We are all one. Um, most of us in higher ed are our former PK-12 um, educators. And um, I just think it's important that we work together. And that's really the, the, the crux of this, that we, um, there are examples of partnerships um, Robert Echo's letter names alternative edu uh, alternative education like the excuse me alternative pathways like the residency programs that we already have that are working really well and I just wanted to um, echo the sentiments already articulated um, by Darren and just share that that is the, the the crux of the concern is really just having this other pathway that doesn't have the same kind of accountability and so then you're going to have you know um, we're going to basically say. <clears throat> that we don't need these things. And I'm not saying we need them all <laughs> either, to Darren's point, um, but I just uh, hope that we will have some um, equity across the pathways um, as well. So I just wanted to make that note. So thank you so much. And I will yield now to the next person. Thank you. Ms. Roebuck. Hi, Hi. good morning. Excuse me, uh, getting over a cold. Um, yeah, I wanted to just support Darren, what you were saying about the letter. I definitely support the letter if it will help to um, prevent the inequities that exist in education. I think that's a great idea, but I wanted to clarify when you're talking about testing, are you talking about testing um, in terms of praxis exam um, to be one of the, to eliminate that um, in one of the pathways? I was just a little bit confused about that. That's that's a great question. The letter that I was uh, thinking we would draft would be directly toward the EdTPA and the PPAT. Um, we've already in previous meetings gone through and looked at uh, praxis exams, and we've eliminated a number of those that we thought would be redundant um, with the blueprint and so forth. But this would just be uh, the portfolio-based assessments. Okay. And I think that would also help to, um, with the teacher shortage that we have, it will help to, you know, get more teachers in because it's, you know, not as... It, it, would, it would help to get more teachers in the profession since we have such a shortage. So I, I'm definitely in support of the letter. Thank you. Ms. Bobbitt? Um, 
Good morning. This is Janelle Bobbitt, and I am also in full support of the letter and wondering if we could compose the letter collaboratively during one of our monthly meetings. Uh, Janelle, um, I think the the I, I think that's a great idea. Um, there was sort of a suggestion. Melita and I had talked about this a little bit um, that maybe we form a committee um, that would be willing to come together, meet separately, uh, and have a letter that we could come back with for our approval, and then we could also send that to the to the state board as well. Okay, looking forward to joining the committee. Um, Miss Dr. Allen. Yes, I just wanted to um, also weigh in um, in support of uh, what Dr. Shockley said that I am still um, curious and you know wondering about the monitoring and accountability of um, in district uh, pathways or in district uh, training programs, um, and particularly looking at uh, Mr. Eccles' questions around how is an in-district training program um, specifically different from an alternative program? How does MSDE plan to monitor in-district training programs? And then is there a comparable application for state approval um, of these programs? Um, and so, you know, I'm just a little, um, I guess, nervous because there are a lot of questions that are kind of hanging in the balance in terms of how these programs, uh, what they'll look like, <laughs> how they'll be monitored, what accountability will look like. Um, and I'm wondering if a letter um, is enough to, um, you know, to, to, to have a fuller picture um, to answer these questions um, if we were to adopt the regulations as is. I just wanted to say that. Ms. Cordalis? Yeah, just a little clarification. So we're asking, we're talking about writing a letter to ask a legislator to write an amendment, propose an amendment to the law. Is that what we're asking? Because it's in the law currently, right? So, yes. we, so, yeah, we that need is... a, so it has to be an amendment to the law. So we're asking a legislator to write an amendment, to propose an amendment to the law to be voted on. Yes, that is correct. Okay. And we know this has already happened because we know the requirement that administrators on the career ladder uh, spend a certain amount of time in the classroom. That's also been addressed by the legislature as well. So there's there's precedent. I mean, they go back in and change things from time to time. Um, and I think, again, you know, this is something where when the blueprint was composed, we were kind of in a different environment. Now, you know, if you look at the number of studies that we have, the in-district pathway is something that we added. Uh, that was not present, you know, as part of the blueprint, that's extra. Um, we, there's a lot of new things that have happened, which I think is why it's worth them going back in and taking a look. Thank you. Okay, so it, so we got a couple of things going on. There are still, there are some concerns. So it looks like we do have support of the board to draft this letter um, in the form that it would come from out of the subcommittee and then come back to our group. But there are some concerns about if the letter will be enough, which was brought up by Dr. Allen. And so, um, Sean, I guess question for you or question for Kelly in terms of logistics. Because we would be drafting a letter that would come from out of our subcommittee and then you know having the communication with the state board as well as MSD, we're trying to put all the pieces together. If we're sending this to the legislative, and Kelly, I don't, I'm not sure who the question is directed at. Uh, if we're sending it to the legislator and we're asking for an amendment uh, for the with the law to kind of take these consideration in place, looking at the expertise in our board and what's going to be best um, for the teacher shortages as well as ed educators across the state. What are the logistics here? So if we get this letter out for them and then the legislative session, are we are we correct on the timeline? Like what I don't want to have this letter in vain and we're kind of too late. So what I guess I need some clarification in terms of us in this letter, getting it to where it needs to go and all of that. So I, I guess I, I need to make sure that I'm clear on on the the goal here. So Am I correct in understanding that the goal is to craft a letter to the legislature to provide research suggesting that the nationally recognized portfolio assessments at TPA and PPAD 
which are currently required in statute for our Maryland approved programs, that that be removed as a requirement. Is that the goal during the session? Yes, that would be the goal because that would be one of the things that I think would, now that we are thinking about introducing an industry pathway, would help produce a lot more equity. Um, that yeah, that's exactly what it is. There, you know, we've gotten so many concerns about the fact that there'll be inequities. I think there are things our board can do to address that, but there are things that are out of our power to address that. Right. And because it's and so statute. of course that's where the avenue comes in that yes, we'd actually need to begin to weigh in with the legislature on this and say that we've got a lot of good reasons why we think, you know, the the requirement that by 2025 it needs to be in place certainly needs to be right. repealed. And that we might want to think about, or in my case, I think we should recommend we do away with these entirely, as as so many other states have done. Sure. So it's absolutely you can send that letter. You can send that letter whenever you want. I would suggest, you know, the sooner the better. Um, it's probably going to take more than a letter. Um, it's it's you're probably going to want to decide how you want to approach the legislature and and who you want to have conversations with you know, there's there's a, a way to do this um, I think a letter is a great first step um, and if the board wants to go in that direction absolutely you can you can do that whenever and there is a mechanism for that I don't know it off the top of my head but I can find out there's a way to submit um, that kind of information to the legislature um as far as these regulations are concerned because I think what I heard was like, concern maybe about the timeline about yes like what's the so if yeah. we you know so we if, have a letter with the support of the state board as well as potentially msde because we're picking up off of a conversation that we had a couple months ago um at the time we were still working very collaboratively with superintendent uh shortery and so now kind of keeping that momentum and so um, and so with the state board, with MSDE, with us, because it's in statute, it's not something we can just kind of bring up on something we want to change. Um, so in terms of what does this need to look like? Because like you just said, like sometimes a letter may be, that's a good starting point, but it may be more than a letter. Darren and I are happy to go and speak on it if it comes up or if it requires us to go to Annapolis, we can happily do that. But just kind of looking like we're, where are we like with this in terms of logistically and legally where like where do we stand and what do we need to do so and again and maybe i'm not following melita so i apologize let, let me know if i'm not um as as far as these regs are concerned if there is a um concern that, you know, if we adopt these regulations, what happens if during the session, the goal is met and they amend the law and they take out that that requirement, um, that's fine. It, it happens every year. Um, would we have to then open the regulations, that one section of the regulations and remove that requirement? Um, yeah, absolutely. If and I mean, I assume that would be the intention. You wouldn't have to. You can always do more in reg than in law. But clearly, this board is thinking that that they would not want that requirement. So yes, it would just involve an amendment. So so on the one side, I don't recommend that you pause this work in order to meet this goal. Um, mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you want to talk about the logistics of how to meet this goal, I, I'm not in a position to do that right now. I can certainly, we can talk internally, we can talk with our legislative liaison, we have one here, she's going to be much more knowledgeable about how that works. So I don't want to provide you misinformation about exactly what steps I would recommend personally for you to take. Um, let's talk with our legislative liaison and see how, how it's done. Yes, that, that would be good. And then I guess if there can be a brief meeting that um, Darren and I can attend just with the liaison to know if we're moving in the right direction so that we know how to come back as a board and as chair, um, how to advise the board and to go about this, because I am not sure of the steps and the logistics. And I do want to make sure that we are doing things correctly. Melita, can I jump in really quickly? All right. So... I think the letter is a great idea. And right now, most of the legislators are getting their agenda ready for the upcoming session. So what I would recommend is if you have a relationship with your delegate or your state senator to set up a meeting with them 
to let them know of what we want to do if the letter is approved by the state board. And it looks like it is um, getting support from our board, setting up a meeting with your state legisl legislator, someone who really supports education, equity, and those kinds of things, and see if they could sponsor this on their agenda. Because you have to have a, a senator or a delegate who will introduce it into committee. So I mean, that's pretty much it. I mean, we're in November now. Most of them are getting their agendas together for January when the next session opens. So I think we're just, we're in a good timeline right now, but time is of the essence. So I think between now and December, getting it to whoever you want to sponsor it to get it to the floor. Thank you. Ms. Wilson? You're welcome. Um. Yeah, I was just going back to the regs because I was trying to figure out this inequity between the portfolio summative assessment. And, and there is um, language around an effective or comparable rating on a summative evaluation of teaching performance at the end of the induction period listed in the in-district training. It is the in-district pathway is dot oh three uh and then it is down a little further um so i i'm also just wondering if that um uh, might ease the minds that seems like that would be something that would then be fleshed out in regulations or in, in approval of those programs of what that summative evaluation is so it's not like people in that in-district pathway are going to avoid an evaluation of their teaching performance. It's just more broad that it doesn't have to be one of those. So I, I just wanted to, to bring that up if that allays any concerns that we're just like opening the floodgates with an in-district training program, but then it really does go to the enforcement and monitoring of those in-district programs to make sure that that summative evaluation is, is maybe not exactly the same as the breadth and depth of ed tpa or something like that but that it exists that we're not just letting people just waltz in thank you dr shockley thank you um i just wanted to share that the <clears throat> conversations that we've been having um with our pkto PK partners um as you remember the um public comment from anne arundel county for example um one of the counties that has a very strong a teacher residency program that's an alternative pathway is this is more than the summative assessment this is about the ongoing assessments and the other components that um we find from evidence-based practices are important to the success of um, a teacher and so um with that in mind i just hope that we you know consider the programs that we already have and and, and um and talk about ways to strengthen those opportunities uh, in the last meeting, we heard from a district that talked about how, you know, when you don't have an IHE in your district, pardon me, it's not as, as easy. Um, and we understand that um, that district also has a has an IHE partner as well. Um, and my point is just that um, the, the other component of the letter from the deans and directors is very much that these suggestions made are if the in-district programs um, go forward. Uh, the, the 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 challenge is, or the sentiment is that um, many IHEs and PK-12 partners, districts find that the alternative education programs, um, alternative pathway, pardon me, programs already offer a, a lot of what we are discussing. And so um, certainly there could be ways to um, um, add some flexibility to those programs as they exist. And according to the Maryland Leads, website and commentary from um, the most the the last superintendent every district I believe has um, some sort of um, grow your own uh, partnership and other partnerships with an IHE that will also support closing the gap with the teacher shortage and I just hope that we consider that thank you um Dr. Allen buttons <laughs> Um, I was just to build upon uh, what Dr. Shockley um, said, I was just wondering if I could hear um, from the folks who are, I guess, in support of in-district um, uh, preparation, um, what are, what are you, what is, what are we not able to achieve 
with um, the alternative certification um, preparation programs or that some of the programs that Dr. Shockley has mentioned. I guess that's my question. Like, I'm, I'm just wondering why we need an in-district pathway. Could, could I ask Kelly? Kelly, I think you did a really good job last time of explaining that credit count option that used to exist and how, um, how this in-district formalizes that a little bit more so that you can't just take a set of courses and get certified. That that was really compelling to me. So I'm not sure if there's like a quick version you could give of that again. Sure. Um, yeah. So so you know the genesis of this of this pathway, as I shared last month, kind of you know grew over time. It started off as one thing that was that was pretty different um, and and morphed into this um, under Mr. Chaudhary's leadership. Um, but as I shared during the last meeting, we have had what what's called, we call it transcript analysis or credit count pathway to certification for, for decades in this state. And um, I, when we last looked, which was oh, several years ago, so, so please take it with a grain of salt. But I think we were one of 11 uh, states at the time that, that did this transcript analysis pathway. And um, given the fact that we, we do import uh, the majority um, on most years of our teacher workforce, around 50 to 60 percent of our teacher workforce in Maryland, um, although you know, both boards were very clear. They wanted to eliminate transcript analysis um, and MSDE was was right on board with that. But um, we heard loud and clear the concern that, you know, we were not going to have an, enough pathways for our career changers that want to enter the classroom. And given the fact that our um, the number of our conditional teachers continues to rise significantly every year, um, you know, we did not want to inadvertently end up in a place where we're now, uh, you know, exacerbating the shortage because these individuals don't have enough choice. Um, maybe they're not interested in going and getting their master's degree, or maybe they are on the Eastern shore or the Western or the Southern parts of our state because all of our alternative residency programs are right in the center and there aren't that many. Um, so, so, so we said, okay, well, how can we do this? How can we still allow that, you know, that content person who has the bachelor's degree, um, and wants to, to teach, how can we, uh, carve out a pathway for them, um, that is as rigorous as possible, um, but is not that credit count, do it wherever you want, whenever you want, piecemeal it here, piecemeal it there. We, we wanted something that was more cohesive and something that we could monitor through the department to ensure that, you know, districts weren't, you know, just doing whatever they wanted. Um, not that they would, but, um, you know, we do need to have a level of accountability. So, so this is how we kind of eventually, and everybody that's been on the board for a while knows, this is how we finally arrived um, at, at the language that you see here before you today. Um, so I would, you know, I would say that it is important that we maintain a pathway for those uh, career changers uh, who are not interested in traditional preparation. Um, and, uh, and I think that what this board and the state board have, have developed through this pathway is, um, is exciting. And I think it can be, uh, I think it can be a model for the nation if we do it right. Melita, can I add as well? Um, Ms. Bobbitt is ahead of you, Darren. So um, Ms. Sure. Bobbitt, I think, yeah. It was my understanding of the alternative teacher pathway, like for the grow your own um, model that it's performance-based um, and uh, in alignment with the instructional framework. So as opposed to building a portfolio that you would do if you were in a traditional program, it's based on your performance. It's based on the evidence that this teacher is in the classroom. This is what's happening with their instruction, their ability to plan, your ability to meet the needs of students. And there are other things in place in different school districts. And I also thought that was the reason for each school district having their own grow your own program because the needs are different um 
among different school districts. So that was my understanding as far as not having the, what is it, the portfolio. Um, and what Kelly said as far as a career changer, who maybe has already completed degrees in other areas, maybe not necessarily education, and now they are switching. So the the performance based as opposed to evaluation based would help them to better learn as they're teaching, as they're working, as opposed to cr creating a portfolio. So that is why I was in support of the letter just to, as a proposal for legislators to just reconsider a few things. Um, my other question is those other programs as far as the traditional teacher preparation program. Now, if it's person still wants to go the traditional route, those things will be in place for that option, correct? But if it's a career changer who would like a different alternative to going back to school, then they could take that the other pathway to becoming an education, an education. Um, uh, Ms. Bobbitt, was that question directed to Kelly or was that directed to the group? Because you said your question. Directed to Kelly. Okay. I apologize. Can you repeat the question? I'm not, I'm not clear. Sure. My question was with the candidates who prefer the traditional route, the evaluation, I mean, the portfolio would still be a part of that preparation program but not necessarily required for the teachers taking the alternative route to participate in the grow your own option. So um, let me first back up and clarify some terminology uh, because we throw a lot of terms around and I, and I don't want to assume that everybody knows what, what we're talking about and they can be confusing. So, so grow your own, um, is really about, um, I mean, if, if you think about it literally, it's it's a great way to think about it. So it's really when districts or communities or states uh, invest in their own community members, when you're talking about a school or a school system, their own employees, whether they're paraprofessionals or teaching assistants or, or whatever have you, bus drivers, whatever have you, they are looking to their own to grow into teachers. And so that is what is really meant by grow your own. And that can be a 30 different flavors, right? So it can be a partnership with College Park for a bachelor's degree, or maybe it's an AAT into College Park with a bachelor's degree. So then you got three partners um, for your paras, right? So that's one of many, many models that could happen. Another model could be a registered apprenticeship, which we don't have yet in this state. We're working on it. Um, Another one may be, um, you know, a career changer. Um, it, it's still grow your own. There's still, let's say, a teaching assistant with a bachelor's degree. They don't need that bachelor's degree. There's a partnership with uh, the community college. Um, currently, the way that would look is, you know, that's transcript analysis that could potentially turn into what we we are thinking of for the industry pathway. So grow your own is a is a is a broader term. So I just want to make sure that everybody is clear on that and that grow your own can absolutely mean a traditional preparation. It does not have to mean alternative. Um, now, I think your question, um, Ms. Bobbitt, and correct me if I'm wrong, is, you know, will there still be those opportunities? You know, will there, there still be a variety of opportunities with these regulations? And the answer is yes. Um, the other question that I think you asked was, for the traditional preparation specifically, are they required to do the portfolio assessment? And yes, and that's what we were talking about with the letter. That is in the law currently that our traditional and our alternative uh, approved preparation programs have to, um, starting July 1st, 2025, they have to incorporate a nationally recognized portfolio based assessment. So, so yes, the, there, there is a difference there. And I think that's what Darren was speaking to was that, um, that there, there could be some perceived inequity 
with, you know, we make these candidates do this, but we don't make these candidates do this. So I, I'm hoping that I answered your question, Ms. Bobbitt. If I didn't, um, please let me know. Yes, but um, with the the reason that we're writing the letter is not to completely eliminate the portfolio basis, only to eliminate it with the teachers who are taking an alternative route or with the candidates who are taking an alternative route. Is that the reason for the latter? Well, so, currently, currently the law only addresses the specific so traditional type route. of candidate. Um, okay. Maryland approved program. It, it only uh, touches on Maryland approved programs. There are other parts of that same law that say for your out of state individuals or for other individuals, um, it's that touch of te that test of teaching ability, which we've interpreted to be a little bit more flexible. But it is very specific that Maryland approved program candidates have to do this nationally recognized portfolio. So yes, because the law is worded that way, we we would be if we drafted that letter asking them to change um, that that requirement for candidates of Maryland approved programs, because that's what's currently in the law. Um, things like the in-district pathway, using the EdTPA for our non-public folks for that pathway, that's outside of the law. That was a decision that this board made. And you can always make that. You, you can always put something in regulation like, like that, um, even if it's not in statute. Um, so, so yes, to answer your question, it would specifically be about candidates of Maryland approved programs because that's the way the law is currently written. All right, Darren and then Dr. Gartland. I just wanted to point out because there was that question uh, about why, uh, you know, the genesis of the in-district pathway, like why it was necessary. And if you go back to the presentation, and I think Kelly sent it out, the regulations deep dive. Um, this is very telling, and it has individual sections to it, but it also lists a lot of the issues we have with teacher diversity, where students or where candidates, teacher candidates of teacher diversity are coming from, the fact that they're not going through traditional programs. And in as much as we're doing, we've not been able to really produce a significant change in increasing teacher diversity. And it's clear that we need more pathways for people to do that. Um, and I think that's one of the things that that caused folks to kind of think about the need for an in-district pathways. You know, it's an additional, yet it's going to have, if it's done correctly, gatekeepers, high quality and so forth. But I think what drove a lot of it, too, was trying to increase teacher diversity as well, because they just don't come through these other traditional pathways. And the, the statistics in that packet are pretty clear. Dr. Gartland, and thank you for your patience. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, oops. Uh, so the July 1st, 2025 implementation date for um, students passing uh, a portfolio, either the either the FDPA or PPAP is in statute, correct? Okay, I see Kelly nodding here. Thank you. So um, Sean, forgive me because you've tried to do your best. <laughs> um, educating me and the rest of the board on what is substantive versus non-substantive. But let me just ask you this, then if we were to um, uh, decide to do 60 in district pathway, would that be a substantive change that would then um, require us to uh, republish the proposed regulation, knowing that Accommodation can't go on during the legislative session. Um, my, inflection, my inflection didn't start end well. Sean, can you repeat? Because I don't know. Debbie sounds muffled on my end, so, but I'm not sure if it's anybody else. So can you repeat what she said just to make sure I heard it clearly? It, it might just be on my end. That's why. Sure. So I and, and Debbie, please let me know if, if I uh, misarticulate the question in any in any way, shape or form. But my understanding of your question is asking whether or not um, removing the in district pathway from uh, the regulations would constitute a substantive change. Um, yeah. And uh, in my and, and grant, I can do more research on the issue, but my and my initial impression, my kind of rapid reaction would be the answer is yes. And that stems from the definition of a substantive change. So uh, as I said at the last meeting, and that's okay, like I said, th this is why you have your lawyer 
at these meetings, but um, the legal definition of uh, a substance. So well, actually, let me let me back up even further. So. A the, the requirement in statute with regard to changes in proposed regulations is found in state government article 10 113. Uh, and it's required that if a unit wishes to change the text of a proposed regulation so that any part of the text differs substantively from the text previously published in the register, the unit may not adopt the proposed regulation unless it is proposed anew and adopted in, the, in accordance with the other provisions of the statute. So the long and short of it is if, if there are any substantive changes, the process begins again. We find the definition of substantive in 10101 of the state government article which means in a manner substantially affecting the rights, duties, or obligations of a member of a regulated group or profession or a member of the public. Um, generally, the way I conceptualize substantive changes, and this is kind of a, a, a framework that I, I, you know, it, it's, you know, you can take your own interpretation, obviously, but, but in my view, the, the litmus test for this is, is the is the public getting what they signed up for? Is the public getting what they essentially uh, were what was proposed? The, the you know what was proposed in the initial um, the initial publication. And the real key critical issue is uh, the you know guidance from the attorney general's office has has looked towards three elements to see if any are present. And if 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 any are present. Um, I, it would constitute a substantive change. Um, the first is, could this have reasonably been anticipated in the rulemaking? If, if it could have been reasonably anticipated, then it's it's likely not a substantive change. If, if, if this is a situation where this could not have been reasonably anticipated, that would constitute a substantive change. The second one, and this is what worries me in this case, is does not decrease in any significant way the benefits that would have been achieved by the regulation as proposed. Um, and the third that goes hand in hand with that is does does not increase in any significant way the burdens that would have been imposed by the regulations proposed because the idea is if this is you know as said in the definition of ten one thirteen or I'm sorry ten one oh one if this is a situation where it is increasing a burden or decreasing a benefit to a member of you know the regulated group or profession in this case the, the, you know teach educators and prospective educators or any member of the public um then that constitutes a substantive change. And that's what I'm concerned about here is there is a, a uh, I think, a, a very reasonable argument, you know, for those educators who are seeking to avail themselves of the in-district pathway, or prospective educators, I should say, that are seeking to avail themselves of the in-district pathway, that this, regul that this proposed change, removing that pathway in its entirety, would substantially affect their rights, would substantially uh, increase uh, you know, the hurdles they have to jump through decrease the benefits that they're afforded. Um, and so to that end, my view would be that it would be a substantive change, uh, which isn't to say that you can't do it, but obviously it means we begin the process anew uh, with, with regard to publication in the Maryland Register for public comment, uh, at least a 30-day period <clears throat> of public comment, reviewing that public comment in its entirety and finding ourselves back here again. Great. Thank you. That, I, I wanted to know that. Would you mind, uh, I don't know if you can multitask or you're doing it already with other things. Could you put the link in so that we have a uh, direct line to see the information about substantive versus not wherever that is in the publication? Absolutely. What I can do is I will. Um, so I'll see if I can find a link to the to the two specific statutes that I referenced. And then um, as far as uh, guidance, I can also see if I can provide an attorney general's opinion that kind of, uh, while it is not, um, you know, binding case law in the way that a, a Maryland uh, Supreme Court or Maryland uh, appellate court <sighs> case would be, um, certainly it can give you some guidance as far as what the, the lens I'm looking at this through. So, I'll see if, yeah, absolutely. And, and that might, the, the attorney general decision might have to go out in, in supplemental materials if I can't get that in, in the chat. But certainly I can get links to the statutes, I'm sure, in the chat. Great. Thank you. Okay. Miss Meadows, and then I feel like I need to, like, we, we just talked about a lot of things in a little bit of time. So, Miss Meadows, and then I feel like I need to recap a little bit. Unless so, you're recap. 
No, no, just really quickly. And I can recap if you want me to. Um, I just it, it, in follow up to what Sean said, and I do appreciate Sean's um, legal position. I could not in good faith move forward with adopting regulations where an entire pathway is removed. So I'm going to go out on a limb and say that I believe wholeheartedly that would be a substantive change um, because we that is a huge change in those regulations. And so let's just think of it that way. If we want to remove it, then this board certainly has the purview to do that. But let's go ahead and think of that as a substantive change if, as we move forward. Okay, so I'm going to attempt to recap. Please chime in if I missed anything because we just had a whole lot going on. Um, so I think we started initially with this letter and kind of getting clarification and making sure we understood what was the purpose behind this letter and why we were writing this letter. Um, I know Dr. Allen had kind of mentioned she wanted to hear from the other board members about you know, how they understood or how this pathway impacts them. And then we kind of went down this road about potentially this is the substantive change if we remove that pathway. Did I capture everything correctly? All right, my listening comprehension is on today. Um, so where we are at now, I think because we don't have a motion on the floor and we're just actually having a robust discussion is with what we do best. I kind of want to come back to the letter. So are we writing the letter? Do we need the letter if we are leaning towards um, pulling out that pathway, which would be a substantive change? I think that's what we need to kind of figure out right now. I don't know if we need a formal motion on the floor because we started off with the letter and now we're kind of here. So we kind of got a lot going on and I'm gonna let Kelly jump in. So I just, I, because I don't, I, I just want to make sure that we're, we're not going to get confused. So again, I'm trying to understand the connection between the letter and the regulations. Like it's clear to me that this board has interest in lobbying for an amendment to the law with regard to the nationally recognized portfolio assessment. That's what I'm hearing. Um, what I'm trying to understand is how that is connected to the regulations. Is it okay if I jump in and answer? I realize there's a couple of people ahead. Well, no, I don't have any hands up on my thing. Darren, go ahead. Go for oh, it. Oh, okay. I was looking at the chat probably. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry if I'm cutting anybody off. Uh, in proposing the letter, the, I wasn't necessarily attempting to connect it so much with the reg or trying to do away with the reg for the industry pathway. What I was trying to do is talk about how Melita and I had worked with the then state superintendent to try and address concerns about the inequity that could open up if you do an industry pathway, because it looks as though there's a potential for there to be sort of two different standards with that. One of the standards that we think is concerning, of course, is going to be the portfolio-based assessments, which, as we said, most states are, are turning away from and we're running straight toward. Now, the idea was we could address some of that concern about the inequity of an industry pathway if we simply took off some of the requirements in the traditional pathway, which is, of course, going to be the portfolio-based assessment. So that's something that we could do. Now, our board can't do that, but we'd have to go through the legislature. Um, and that might eliminate or at least help alleviate some of the concerns about the inequities of these two pathways so that people would feel more comfortable, quite frankly, in supporting an industry pathway. So the idea in, in proposing this wasn't necessarily to try and suggest that we, we you know, take the industry pathway out, although, you know, if that's what the board wants to do, that's, that is understandable, but it was a way of addressing the concerns of inequity over that so we'd feel more comfortable moving forward and keeping it. Um, that was more where the, the genesis came from. Okay, so now we're, we're still kind of back to the letter and so I, I think we have two different issues, but they're connected um, because it sounds like we 
want to lobby to amend the law, which has the in-district pathway, but then we there's conversation about removing this. So where are we going next in terms of do we still need the letter if we're going to make a substantive change? Are these two separate? Do you see these as two separate issues or one big issue? Because that's what I'm, I just want to make sure that we're all thinking about it in the same way or if we're thinking about differently, or if we need to kind of talk it out a little bit more to kind of clarify where we want to go next as a board. Malita, I see these as two separate issues. They're okay. connected logistically, but take it one at a time. I okay. think that there's generally a feeling that is supportive among our colleagues in higher ed and other members of the board that aren't necessarily in higher ed, that portfolio-based assessments are extremely troubling. And whether we go forward or we don't go forward with an industry pathway, I think that we do need to address the concerns that higher ed constituents have brought to us. And as a result, that's a way we can do that. Whether we go forward or not with the industry pathway, to me, does not interfere with us writing a letter. I think we need to draft a letter anyway as a way of, of addressing the feedback that we've gotten from so many different people. And that I think is supported by the majority of people probably on the board, if I can be so bold as to say that. And I think it's it's at least according to uh, then Superintendent Chaudhary would have had the support of MSDE as well. So you don't get an opportunity where multiple groups come together in support of something um, like we have right now. And if we have the potential of having our letter, I think do some influencing with the State Board of Ed, and that's one of the things that Melita can work with with Clarence, um, that could be a very powerful thing in helping us rethink these assessments. So this is, this is, I think, a way of addressing those concerns, but also helping us with some additional concerns that people had over the in-district. But I wouldn't, you know, whether we go forward or we don't with the in-district, I would still go ahead with the letter. Okay, um, Kelly and then Dr. Gartland. I, I agree with Darren, and um, I, I think I just I just want to remind the board that you know the law is the law as it is until it's not right. So we have to we have to do our work based on current law. If that law changes, then it is our job to go in and make the changes that are necessary to realign with the law. It's what we do. We do it every day. So I just I don't want to get too mired in what could be. Um, we can certainly work toward that goal. And if we meet it, fantastic. Then we have more work to do as this board, making amendments to realign. But we should not be looking to what we would like the law to be as we are drafting these regulations. We need to keep in mind, you know, what are the current requirements? And then separately, certainly if this board wants to lobby to change those requirements, um, you can do that. And then we would come back and we would make any necessary changes. So I just want to be clear that, um, you know, the as we develop these regulations right now, we have to look at what's currently in statute. Okay. So with that being said, I think we need to, um, the chair will entertain a motion to convene a subgroup to draft the letter. Um, and then, because these are two separate issues, so the chair will entertain a motion to form a subcommittee to draft the letter um, about our board's concerns about the, lost my train of thought. Dr. Uh, Taylor so moves. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. <laughs> um, uh, seconded by, Kelly, is this a new hand or old hand? Old hand. Okay, um, so motion. I'll start with Karen Yoho, sorry. Karen Yoho, th thank you so much for um, understanding my my thoughts here. Um, so we are <laughs> we are motion um, on the table to convene a subcommittee about um, drafting a letter to get our concerns with um, the uh, portfolio based assessments and how they impact. Um, future educators for the state of Maryland. All in favor for that motion, say aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. aye. Sorry, could you repeat the motion? I'm so sorry. So the motion that is on the table is to convene, uh, um, to form a subcommittee to write a letter about our concerns with the portfolio-based assessments. Okay, thank you. No problem. Um, 
I think all opposed, did I do that? Any abstentions? All right, motion approved to form a subcommittee to draft a letter. So now we actually need um, a subcommittee um, who is possibly interested. One of the, um, Sean or Kelly, I feel like when we've done subcommittees before, was there a limit on the number or did we limit the number? I feel like only being looking at a subcommittee like once. Did we, um, in my tenure here, and Darren, your tenure is a little bit longer than mine, did we cap the subcommittee? Because I remember being on a subcommittee and I think it was like four of us, but I don't know if that was the nature of the issue or it is, is it in our bylaws somewhere where we have to limit the number of people on the subcommittee? I can look. In the yeah, I'm I'm looking I'm looking right now. So yeah, I don't I don't I don't remember. Um, I know typically when we have a subcommittee, either the chair or the vice chair. So I'm going to leave that open to Darren and I to be one of the members. Just with uh, it probably will come down to the flexibility of both us and like who's available. Um, uh, while they're looking, um, just so that it is not a logistical nightmare to um find a date to meet. Um, I probably would suggest to make sure that we have representation from higher ed as well as um, members, you know, a member of the district. And so just so that we can make sure that we capture everything, but don't want to make it too large so that, you know, when you're trying to figure out dates, it's just a nightmare trying to figure out dates. True. Um, I'll volunteer. Tentatively, I would say, Darren, what does... Your, I guess your thoughts about four people, four or five people. Does that sound, does that sound too big? I just know when you're trying to select dates, it's always like a nightmare if you have a ton of people. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess vo volunteers. I I'll volunteer. volunteer. Joy Spain. Okay. All right. Dr. Taylor. Okay. So I've got Dr. Taylor. Um. Joy Spain. I'm just looking up. Janelle Bobbitt. Janelle Bobbitt. Stephanie Farmer. I, I agree. You should only have four with Darren as the fifth person or you mm -hmm. to make it an uneven number. It should be an uneven number. Joy Spain, remind me your constituent group that you are representing. So I'm with AIM, but I'm really with MANSEF, the Maryland Association of Non-Public Special Ed Facilities. So I, I would really like to be on the subcommittee because I know there are a lot of concerns that we have um, from non-public for the portfolio-based assessments. But if you need somebody actually from MANSEF, we do have a MANSEF constituent on the, on the uh, board as well. Okay. And then Stephanie, uh, please remind me of your constituent group again. Maryland Association of Secondary School Principals. Okay. Melita. And yes. if you have one too many, I mean I can I can back down. Go ahead, Darren. Um, uh, for for this, unless it, it, there's something in the bylaws about it, I don't mind it if the group gets a little bit larger because yeah, the letter needs to have the letter needs to have specific talking points. Right. And, and that, that'll be different based on different groups. And the more accurate we are based on the inclusion of different groups, the more powerful the letter is. So I wouldn't I want us to limit to, you know, a smaller number because of logistics, because I think if we do meet, one of the things we're looking for are the talking points to be included within the letter. And, you know, people can send that to us easily. No, no, no. I... I, I agree if there wasn't anything in there, but I do want to make sure that we have a good representation and how it impacts the different entities. So school principals, teacher, um, non-public, higher ed, and then Dr. Allen, did I see your did I see your hand? Yes, there's room. All right. And while you're writing, Melita, if there's any member of the board. Um, that wants to send uh, anything that you think should be included in the letter, um, you could send that, I'm sure, to Melito or myself, and we could make sure it's included. Um, one more, just to, because right now we have six, and I'm thinking just one more, just so that we can have that seven, just in case if we're kind of going back and forth. 
probably one more would be good. So then Darren and I would be the I, uh, the seven. Dr. Zebley, what about you? <laughs> Madam Chair, if you would like me to, I'd be happy to do so. I would be honored. So we'll put Dr. Zebley on there. Um, okay, so this is who I have. I have Dr. Allen and Dr. Taylor, which would give us the perspective of higher ed. Um, Joy Spain, which would be the non-public um, schools. And so that gives us representation there. Dr. Zebley and Ms. Bobbitt, uh, teacher perspective and kind of how they came into education. And then Ms. Farmer would be school principals. I feel like, is that a good representation in terms of making sure we are capturing um, the thought process in the stakeholder groups? And then Sean, we are fine with this number in terms of like open meeting, right? We have that's seven. What, that's what I'm gonna have to research. I don't think it should be a problem. I I, I do want to make sure. I do want to do some research between now and when this meeting, when when this committee meets on whether or not compliance with the Open Meetings Act is required, um, because I, it's something I haven't encountered in my time on this board thus far. So, um, I'll do some research and get an answer back to the board. Okay, so we have the names, and so we will just look out for, uh, it'll probably be, what is that thing called, like a doodle poll or something like that, in terms of a meeting date, and just for the ease and convenience, it will be a virtual uh, meeting. Okay, so I think we are good with that. So now we have that issue, but I don't think we're finished with um, 15, correct? <laughs> Are we finished with 15? I, I, it's a lot going on. We have great discussions. And this was with the thing with virtual. I just feel like there's a lot more moving parts when we're virtual, looking at squares, not looking at squares. Um, Kelly, did we finish 15? Like, were we ready to move on to 16? Or are we still working on 16 in terms of that the pathway that's associated with 15? We have we have not done row sixteen yet, so I will follow your lead. If if we still have conversation to have about the deans and directors letter, that fifteen was the last comment I pulled from that letter. So so you let me know. Okay, all right. I'm going to ask the board: Are we finished with fifteen, and we can move on? All right. Um. So it's about ten thirty four, and I know we're going to go um for like another hour or so do we need like a two minute break because i know like looking at the screen is very different can we take like just a two minute brain break stretch break yeah. let's just say it's 10 34 let, let, let's do three minutes let's get a little razzle dazzle here so let's take a three minute break just to give everybody's eyes and brain like a moment to reset so three minute break um by my time uh i have 10 34 so let's come back together at 10 37.
slowly coming back, the three minutes was like planning time three minutes where it goes very quickly. Because if everyone, as you come back, um, slowly coming back, if you can give me a thumbs up so that I know that you are actually back in front of your computer, um, especially if your camera is not on. Looks like we are all back. I think so. All right. And then Kelly, whenever you are ready. Are we moving to uh, 16? I, I thought we decided we were moving to 16. Yes. <laughs> right. All righty. Okay. This is actually our last batch of comments. Um, for this, these particular regulations. So the next four comments are from, from Robert Eccles, who provided written um, public comment this morning, as well as oral and written public comment last month. Um, so starting with line 16, um, he made the comment to review the definitions of clinical mentor and mentor teacher. They appear synonymous and as such are likely to add confusion using one term is better. So I've noted in that middle column what these definitions are. Um, and as a reminder, the mentor teacher definition is verbatim from the statute. So I'm not recommending that we remove it. Um, this board knows, for those of you who have been on the board, you know that there was um, a time when we just referred to mentor teachers and then we developed the clinical mentor teacher terminology to distinguish the mentor of teacher candidates. Um, as opposed to practicing teachers that are employed, because there was a lot of concern um, that those two roles should be distinguished. So um, our recommendation, which is a non-substantive change, is to remove the definition of clinical mentor because it is clearly defined within the regulations. It's defined um, even further than in the definitions um, in 13A070602 B is that entire section that you see in that in that right hand column. So removing that smaller definition from the definitions is completely appropriate. Um, so I have made that change in um in the version, the draft version that I shared with you uh, this month and last month that has the non-substantive changes. Are there any concerns with that non-substantive change? Okay, 17. 13A070607 B2, references are made to pre-employment training and pre-practicum experiences. Neither has a published definition, so either define them or remove them. And the regulation in question, the provider shall ensure this professional development includes, but is not limited to, pre-employment training, initial coursework, pedagogy, and pre-practicum experiences. Our comment and our recommendation is that defining these terms is not necessary, that we can reasonably interpret that these terms mean that it is happening prior to the practicum and prior to employment, respectively, and clarification if needed can certainly be provided via technical assistance. So we are not recommending removing these terms or defining them. Kelly, I have a question. So with the technical assistance, I, I know it's written a lot throughout here. Um, what does that mean? Does that mean like there's a, a time where MSD offers 
to discuss, uh, train. I don't, I, I see that written a lot. So that's what I just want to get clarification on what that means. Sure. Absolutely. And and that's a great question. And we, we talked a little bit about it last month and we'll, I think we'll talk about it some more today. Um, so, you know, it really is the department's role to provide technical assistance. It's, it's why we're here. Right. So not every law and not every regulation is crystal clear. Um, there are certainly room for interpretation. And there are many things that that we are expected to provide guidance for, training for, interpretation on. Um, and and certainly if there are any questions. So like for this, for an example, for this, um, Joy, you know, if an if an EPP or an LEA as, as a partner um, in this process didn't understand what was meant by pre-practicum, then certainly there is someone here to answer that question and say it means an experience that happens before they're enrolled in the practicum portion of their candidacy. Um, that's one side of it, you know, questions. Uh, we're here to support and answer questions. The front side of it, especially when you have a set of regulations this big that are changing, is there has to be a systematic rollout of, of training and technical assistance for all the players. So we'll, I think, talk a little bit more about that later. Um, I think we'll have plenty of time, hopefully, to get to that agenda item today. Um, but that technical assistance, as I shared last month, will be a variety of things. It will be in person, it will be virtual, it will be um, small group, it will be whole group, it will be several different constituents depending on the regulation. Um, there's a lot that's going to have to go into rolling these out. Thank you, Kelly. Sure. Were there any other questions? surrounding that for clarification. Pardon me. Um, Kelly, do you mind sharing your screen? Oh, um, but if you thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Shockley. I saw that and thank you. Can you see it? Okay. Yes, thank you. <laughs> All righty. Are we ready? Okay. 18. Update the definition of alternative teacher preparation program to reflect new language from House Bill 1219, which was this last session. So we actually talked about this. Um, I can't remember if it was last month or the month before. We are absolutely aware that this definition has been updated in statute and very much like I just discussed with, you know, the law is the law until it's not, and then we have to make amendments. Um, I have had discussions with our legal counsel and Sean has assured me that it is fine to publish the regulations like this and then come back and amend them to realign that definition. And this is actually the perfect example of why you don't promulgate regulations during session because something like this changes and then you're, you're in this exact position. So we're very aware that we do have to come back immediately and amend this definition to realign it, but we are not recommending that we pause the process to do that at this time. All right. Row 19. Consider inserting the now published 2024 KCREP standards. Um, and I don't know if we've had an opportunity to talk about this in the last few months. Um, the incorporation by reference regulation is where we incorporate all the national standards um, that our programs have to align depending on what type of program they are. And as, as we have discussed many times over the past five years, um, you know, it, it was not our preference to incorporate all those by reference. We have to. It is a requirement uh, by the um, Division of State Documents, and it's an entire big process. And so what that means is that we will absolutely have to open these regulations at a minimum of once a year just to change that incorporation by reference anytime any standards are republished, um, we will have to open that regulation and we will have to update. So again, I do not recommend pausing to update KCREP right now. It will be in phase two and it's something that we can update as soon as we we open those again. And we will probably, there. and by that time, there, there may be something else that we have to update. It's something we're constantly going to have to monitor.
And that is all uh, for this particular set of regulations. Did we discuss 20? Hold on. I... You're absolutely right. Wait a minute. Why is mine? Wait, I do I am I moving? Yeah, I have 20 through 20. Right. I oh, you're right. Work. You're right. I have a Sorry about work. that. We have it seems like we page. should be done, Kelly, right? <laughs> we have a whole other page. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. AIB. Right. That's right. Okay. So we have the AIB and we, and we have the Reading League too. Those are the last two. All right. 20. Top of, if you're on the printed paper, top of the next page. Mm -hmm. So we looked at this letter when we looked at the licensure regulations. Um, this was one of the ones that kind of split the comment between the two. So for these particular reg regulations, the AIB provided three comments. And the way the AIB um, wrote their letter, if, if you're looking at the, the letter, is they had provided public comment the last time around. And so they basically said, okay, this is what we asked you to do. Like, did you do it? Or this was your response. And that's kind of how they laid out the letter. Um, and then they sometimes made further recommendations. So when you see in the summary, for instance, in line 20, where it says the AIB further recommended, it is kind of like their next set of, of feedback. So the first one says that they further recommend that the experiences and skills that undergraduate teacher candidates should receive over the course of the undergraduate practicum be specified in the regulations, including classroom experience in diverse settings with different types of students and learners and at different times in the school year, such as the beginning of a school year, at the end of a marking period, and prior to standardized testing. The uh, regulation itself is uh, in the middle column. The regulation itself is copied and pasted from the law. It is verbatim. Um, with that being said, um, and just to give everyone a little bit of history, I would say maybe three years ago, if my memory serves, uh, this particular regulation was drafted to be more prescriptive. And we did say that we wanted um, the practicum to include, I think we said the beginning of the year and the end of the year. We never went into marking periods. We never went into standardized testing times. Um, but we did say uh, the beginning and ending of the year. And that uh, there were a lot of concerns lot of concerns um, regarding calendars and schedules and, you know, does it have to be consecutive? You know, can you see the end of the year before the beginning of the year? And in the end, the recommendation was made by what was called um, the Superintendent's Advisory Committee for Educator Preparation and Certification, I believe is what it was called. Um, that committee, which was made up of higher education, private and public, non-public, school, private schools, MANSEF, um, LEA, superintendents, HR directors, the recommendation was made that we remove that language and that we just use the language of the law and we don't get more prescriptive. Um, and so that's why we have what we have. And so our recommendation at this time is not to become more prescriptive because we've we've been down that road and, and we got a tremendous amount of pushback and, and the law is the law. And so I think that we're safe by using the language of the law. Um, certainly as a department, we can suggest through our technical assistance that we provide candidates with those experiences, you know, consider being able to see the standardized testing weeks or the beginning and ending of a, mar of a marking period or school year. Um, but I think that regulating that is, is probably getting too prescriptive. It's not a recommendation at this time. Were there any questions or concerns about that? Okay. Row 21, still with the AIB. This is in reference to the eligibility of a mentor teacher. Uh, the MSDE further revised this section. Oh, let me scroll up a little. <clears throat> to include substantial upgrades 
that address how a mentor teacher will be identified in the interim until the career ladder is well established. So if you remember, this is that regulation um, that defines the clinical mentor during our last round of substantive changes. We um, beef this section up quite a bit. I know that it cuts off if you're looking at the printed version, um, but the very last thing, just as a reminder that we added um, was, be selected using the following criteria from the career ladder system as applicable when the accountability and implementation board determines that the career ladder system is well established, that's from the law, uh, until the AIB makes a determination that the career ladder is well established, meet the requirements that are listed above, and a partner school may select a clinical mentor who is not on the career ladder if the partner school can demonstrate the need to justify the selection. So that was the very last thing that we added. Uh, so this back to this comment, uh, seven criteria were established to ensure that the mentor teacher is a highly competent teacher. The AIB agrees that this additional language is useful and comprehensive. In some elements, additional clarification or examples may be needed to ensure consistent selection practices to ensure highly com competent teachers. For example, criteria B1 notes that the mentor teacher should be a highly competent teacher demonstrated by evidence of impacting student achievement. And remember the law just says highly competent. And one of the things that we as a board um, talked at length about was, well, how do we know if they're highly competent? And you know, we threw around a lot of ways that we could do that. And if you'll recall during those conversations, we we decided to steer away from being too prescriptive about how that could be determined, um, just to give everybody a little bit of history of how we got here. Um, however, the AIB um, does think that it's vague and open-ended, leaving room for significant variance across the state. And they recommend that this be modified to specify permissible locally determined options, such as principal supervisor recommendation, supported by recent teacher evaluation, recent observation data, student learning objective data, student performance data, et cetera. These can be added to the regulations at a later date. So basically what they're saying is we want you to consider when you open these regs again, getting more prescriptive with regard to this particular um, portion. Um, so you are not recommending any modifications at this time. The EIB has explicitly stated it could be done at a later date should we choose to go this route. Um, and, and certainly, um, and this is another area where we, we're seeing you know, the term technical assistance, we can certainly provide guidance and technical assistance with regard to this in the, in the meantime. And if you know, either board feels like it really should be codified, we can, we can do that at a later date. Okay. Uh, Dr. I think Dr. Gartland had a comment or a question. Just a quick thing about the history. Um, that's how I remember it too, Kelly. And one of the things I remember us talking about is that, especially where, where we are so lacking in finding special education teachers, um, this would be something that might give somebody pause if their job was going to be contingent upon their students, um, the extent which that they, um, uh, the students, show um, positive educational outcomes. So I, I like what AIB is recommending because certainly No Child Left Behind was the first time that we really um, nationwide were responsible for being held accountable for kids with disabilities um, outcomes. Um, but I, that I think it would be easy to 
maybe consistent to leave it up to um, the school districts with guidance uh, from MSD and technical assistance. And I think that, you know, as we as we roll these out, certainly if if we're seeing districts and if our EPP partners are seeing districts identifying mentors that are highly competent based on measures that really aren't demonstrating that they're highly competent, that's then we should we should codify something. Um, it's something we'll have to pay attention to. Okay, line 22, this is the last comment um, from the AIB. The AIB recommended that several provisions in the blueprint law related to educator preparation be included in the regulations. So this was, if, if you were on the board at that time when they provided their letter, I think it was last May, um, you know, they basically had a list of um, if you look at statute 6-121, there is a, a long list of um, attributes that they want to see in an, an, an educator preparation program in Maryland. And they suggested that that language was missing from the regulations. And they cite um, as an example the requirement that the instructional program and work organization of partner schools in teaching practica be designed to reflect the career ladder and that the author and the second example, the authorization of MSDE and MHAC to approve teacher preparation apprenticeship programs registered with the Maryland Department of Labor. And they're and they're suggesting that the regulations still don't include these provisions. So I, I did go through them again. And I know that we as a board went through every single line um, last time and, and we found we found each we found each of those provisions. Um, the first one that they've given as an example, I've noted the language where it can be found in the right hand column. It's 13A070609A3, the instructional program and work organization of a partner school located located in a local school system shall reflect the career ladder once the AIB determines that the career ladder system is well established throughout the state. So it is there. Um, the other ones are there too. Um, I did double check. Um, as far as the apprenticeship component, um, we purposefully did not put this in regulation. It's crystal clear in the law. Um, <laughs> we did not feel like there was any um, need to interpret it or expand upon it. It is clear that the department and MHEC may authorize a teacher preparation program to run an apprenticeship. So we're not recommending that we we add it to these regulations. We can certainly we can certainly cite the law in this instance. All right. Okay, so now we move to the Reading League, Maryland's comments for these particular regulations. I know we heard from them with the licensure regulations as well. Their first comment, line 23, we are concerned that multiple terms such as science of reading, principles of scientifically based reading practices, research-based literacy instruction, these are all types of examples they have in quotations, are frequently used and could be inconsistently applied. Ensuring the regulatory language is consistent and well-defined is critical and will help teachers and teacher preparation programs understand what is expected of them when the term science of reading and similar items are used in code. And I didn't copy and paste any regulations here because there are multiple. Um, it, it would have not been worth trying to fit them in this box. Um, and we do agree that after the regulations are promulgated uh, or after they're adopted and we start that second round of promulgation, um, that we, we probably should decide as a state what our definition of science of reading is going to be. Now, I don't think that these regulations are, are the appropriate regulations to define that. If, if the state, if the Department of Education wants to define um, the science of reading outside of any legislation that occurs, um, it would certainly impact several regulations with the Department of Ed. So, so I could, it's probably more appropriate to do that in another set of regulations and point to that. Um, but we do acknowledge 
acknowledge the fact that we we want to make sure that um, the understanding of what is required when we talk about um, uh, research-based literacy instruction is clear. And if we have to amend these regulations to make sure that is clear or to point to a definition that's established, then certainly we should do that. Um, but I'm not recommending that we pause at this time to do that. Any questions or concerns? Twenty-four? Twenty-four. All right, still with the reading league. Uh, the draft literacy competencies in these regulations, so this is 13A0706, um, 13B specifically for this particular section there. So if you if you remember the literacy competencies, they are divided um, into two sections. One section is for our P12 and our secondary teachers. And then the other section is for our early childhood elementary special ed and ESOL. It's in regard to that latter section that this comment is made. In fact, I think the next two comments. Um, the draft literacy competencies in these regulations are a good start but they lack the coherence of succinct, I can't say this word, someone's going to have to say it for me, succinctly, succinctly written and comprehensive competencies adopted by other states. So they go on to cite what's called the Maryland Elementary Literacy Competencies. And if you'll remember, there was a work group that um, ran, I want to say, 24. 15, 2016 to 2019, I think. Does that sound right? I see Dr. Taylor nodding her head. Um, and, and the product of that work group was what was their citing, the Maryland Elementary Literacy Competencies. Um, they say the work group developed literacy standards carefully aligned to national standards and evidence-based reading research um, to design Maryland's existing elementary literacy program to include 14 literacy competencies organized into 48 organizing principles. The Reading League Maryland's policy committee members carefully cross-referenced um, these competencies, and while each of the competencies is listed in the draft regulation, they're not structured or coherent with the, the same way that that document was put together. So as, as alluded to in this comment, um, we did use that document to develop the competencies. And so we did not get into the grand, like we did not go as deep um, into this into the indicators and everything that the um that the work group put together in, in their document. We have stayed high level for the purpose of these regulations. Um, at this point in time, we are not recommending that we that we dive deeper in these regulations and codify that information. We are recommending that we stay high level. We're not recommending changes at this time. Any questions or concerns here? Okay. All right. So Kelly, is that, is that it? Or do you have one more? There's one more and I don't know why it cut off. Um, it's not on my printed paper, but I can see it right here. So I'm just going to read it to you from the e okay, Cause I don't have a 25. Yeah. I don't have a 25. That would be 25, right? Mm-hmm. 25. Mm -hmm. I don't have a 25. Okay. I do remember this one. So still talking about the same area of the regulations. Um, the recommendation was made to um, uh, the way that we currently have it is if you look at the regulations, it's uh, literary literacy processes, literacy instruction, in the diverse classroom, literacy assessment. And then the fourth kind of area of the competencies is research based literacy instruction aligned to the science of reading. And the comment was made that um, the way that the headings are, and subheadings are developed in the regulation um, 
the reading league wasn't a fan of the way that we organized this um, particular set of competencies. And so they actually provided um, an example of how we could, we could better write them. Um, at this point in time, um, we are um, not recommending that we change the structure. Um, certainly, if it, if it is confusing to um, EPPs or to districts or to candidates, we can change it in a future um, iteration or amendment. The second piece of this comment, um, they did call out there's some language that this board added um, near the uh, near the end um, prior to going to publication. And it was specifically in response to a report that came out from NCTQ. And so we wanted to make sure that we got that uh, analysis from NCTQ. And so we did add a couple places where um, where NCTQ recommends specifically this language and we did embed it. And it was noted by the Reading League, like this is not in that elementary competencies document that you cited. And that's true. It's not. Um, and we talked about it when we added it. It, it was specifically from, uh, from an NCTQ publication. So we acknowledge that um, that was purposeful. And we are not recommending that we pull it out. And I do believe that is the last comment. Did you, could you please just go up a little? I'm trying to look at the uh, actual doc. Thanks. So just for 25. Thank you. This one? No, she said it started at 25 because we don't have it on our document. Is that what you meant? Dr. Yeah, just say 25 because I'm trying to look at the packet of the full information. That's all. Is that what you want to say? No, uh, 25, please. On your. It's... This is 25. No, I think that's 24. Yeah, go down one more, I think, Kelly. Oh, sorry. Yeah, good. Oops. Thank this you. This one. Yeah. Because we have the full um, reading lead, so I just want to read it in the narrative. Thanks. Yeah, I don't know why it cut off. Were there any other questions about this particular comment? All right. Seeing that we don't have any question or comments, I'm just going to say, woo, we have finished them both. So just take a, we have finished those. So those board members that have been on here from the beginning, we actually got through them all, all of the public comment testimony, the robust discussion. And so here we are, um, we had the pleasure of being here from the beginning. This has been a long journey. Um, and so now what happens is that now we need to make the decision, correct, Kelly, um, to adopt. Is that correct? The next, the next step is for the board to vote um, for both, for both sets, because I know we just talked about um, program so, approval. Um, because it's just a little bit fresher because we just finished, um, which one did we just finish? Programs? No, programs, correct? Yep. Yep. Because we just finished programs, um, I would say, um, as a board, do you need a minute just to review it all again? Or can we, can the, the chair will entertain a motion to adopt the program regulation, which is 13A0706? So move. Motion to adopt um, 13A0706. So I'll second. Okay, seconded by Ms. Karen Yoho. 
Um, all in favor um, to adopt COMAR 13A0706, which is the program's regulation, say aye. 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 Melita, you may have to do a roll call for this. Yeah, I was just, th I was just thinking about I that. Would, yeah, I would suggest that would be probably right. the better. So because this is a major decision here, we are going to do a roll call. Um, Kelly, I don't have my attendance sheet in front of me. Can you do the roll call? So Kelly's just going to call your name and you just say yay, nay, or abstain from the vote. So uh, just to recap, the motion on the floor is to... Um, adopt COMAR 13A0706. And so those were the regulations surrounding programs. Did what, did you want to have discussion or no? I, I, I hope we don't. I, I'm not going to say we don't need, Sean's like laughing at me. I'm like, I don't think we need discussion, but I don't, I don't. Do, is there any further discussion? Let me say that. Since there is a motion, it was seconded. Is there any additional discussion um, surrounding 13A0706. I have a point of inquiry um, and clarity. We're voting um, with the reckon with the changes that we've all discussed. Is that correct? That's I, I'm that's where I was going. Thank you. Thank so you. I just we we talked a little bit last time. If you'll remember, there was that one non-substantive change. That there was some concerns about like we don't want to change everything. We just want to change the uh, where it's appropriate, and it was specifically with regard to using the terminology disabilities um, in lieu of exceptionalities. So I did want everyone to know that I I went through the regs again, and the only two places that are changed are specific to students with disabilities. So you can ease your minds. Um, so, so the version that I sent you, and this is important since we are voting, um, the version of the regulations that we're voting on now would be the versions that I sent. Um, you got them in October, but I sent them again yesterday. And they say, you know, 13A0706 with non-substantive changes. So those are the regulations that we're talking about right now. I just want to be very clear about that. Um, Hold on. Dr. Allen, um, what is your comment or question? Yeah, I just had a quick question um, in relation to the in-district um, certification pathway. Is it possible to add an effective date to give us more time to figure things out before it goes into effect and to add that to the regulation? Is that something that is possible? So a couple things. So one, just to be clear, um, because I know we're talking about a lot of stuff at once, um, that that is a part of the other regulations. So when we get there, that's for them. But I can answer it. So unless Sean tells me I'm wrong. Um, two, if we add the effective date in the regulations, that's going to be a substantive change. Um, however, we can as both both of these boards can decide the effective date of the regulations in general. We have never um, assumed that these regulations were going to become effective immediately upon adoption. Um, they're so massive. And you may decide that it's it's appropriate to have the program approval regulations become effective before the licensure regulations. It's, it's something we haven't discussed. It can be done um, clerically. We can tell um, we can tell the um, Department of um, State documents exactly when we want it to be effective. It does not have to be in the regulation. So that's that's the information I have. I hope I hope that answered that. If you do want to put an effective date just for that pathway, um, it would require a substantive change. Any other questions or discussions? Uh, so I think I'm confused on which date we're voting on right now. So can you just tell me which seat to look at? So we're looking at the, the packet. I, I decided to do the one we just finished since it was very fresh. So okay. the one we just finished, which was the thinner packet that we ended with the, that had the AIB, the comments we just did. So we're, that's the thinner packet. And that was about the programs. The thicker packet that we did in like September, October, that one was um, licensure. Okay. Mm. Okay. 
Um, Ms. Bobbitt? And just to clarify that since we did confirm that the reason for us drafting the letter is separate from the way that the regulations are written now, it is okay to adapt adapt the regulations as they are now, and then we will continue with our committee meeting. Correct. Because we okay. said they were two separate issues. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or concerns? All right, so motion, current motion that's on the floor is to adopt POMAR 13A0706. And so just to be clear that we are adopting the one that was sent to us with the non-substantive changes and that the discussion and the changes were made um, surrounding the term disabilities and exceptionalities. Correct. Did I capture all of that? All right. So more questions before we can go vote. Ms. Yoho? Uh, yes. I just read in the chat that Chris McGee wants to know if she can give her vote through the chat. I was told with my board uh, for Maryland Open Meetings that when it's a public meeting, you cannot, since the public cannot see that. But uh, uh, Sean can fill us in. But I just wanted to let you know that she had put that in the chat. Yeah, I saw it in the chat. I was going to address it. Just in, she's like, just in case we can't um, hear her. I was going to. Tr I'm sh trying to get to the vote so that maybe we. She will be able to vote um, first. I was going to say, could she go first in terms of us doing the roll call, just in case she has better Wi-Fi right now. All right. So I think we're ready to vote. So we are going to do a roll call vote, and just for. Uh, Fingers crossed, hopefully we can start with Miss McGee. And then if we can't get her the first time, maybe we can circle back to her and see if she has a bit better um, Wi-Fi signal to chime in. Dr. McGee? Can you hear me, Melita? Yep. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, I can't hear me. Are you able to hear me? Oh, my vote is yes before I lose you. Okay, great. <laughs> that worked out. Okay. I'm just going to go in order. Dr. Allen. Yes. Ms. Bacon. Yes. Ms. Bobbitt. Yes. Ms. Carpenter. Yes. Is, is Dr. Kirby with us? I don't think so. And I know Dr. Bolson is not with us. Um, Ms. Farmer. Yes. Dr. Gartland. Yes. Mr. Hornback. Yes. Ms. Kitchen. Yes. Ms. Poye. Yes. Ms. Roebuck. Yes. Dr. Shockley. Yes. Ms. Scardalis. Yes. Ms. Spain. Yes. Dr. Taylor. Yes. Ms. Wilson. Yes. Ms. Yoho. Yes. Dr. Zebley. Yes. And my vote is yes as well. Motion carries. Yeah. Motion carries to approve. Uh, permission to adopt Comar 13A0706. All right, next one. We do need a motion to adopt Comar 13A12, which is the regulation surrounding licensure. Dr. Taylor, so moves. Okay. We need a second. Karen Yoho, second. second. Motion to approve uh, Comar 13A12, 
uh, by Dr. Taylor, seconded by Ms. Karen Yoho. Um, again, we're gonna do the roll call uh, vote. This was the thicker packet or the regulation surrounding licensure that we discussed in September and part of October. Is Dr. McGee still with us? Yes. I think that was a yes. yes. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. McGee. Dr. Allen. No. Ms. Bacon. Yes. Ms. Bobbitt. Yes. Ms. Carpenter. Yes. Ms. Farmer. Yes. Dr. Gartland. Yes. Mr. Hornback. Yes. Ms. Kitchen. Yes. Ms. Poyer. Yes. Ms. Robot. Yes. Dr. Terrell Shockley. No. Ms. Cardales. Yes. Ms. Spain. Yes. Dr. Taylor. I did not hear that, I'm sorry. Dr. Taylor? Yes. Thank you. Ms. Wilson? Yes. Ms. Yoho? Yes. Dr. Zebley? Yes. And my vote is yes. The motion carries. All right. Motion to uh, adopt Comar 13A 12 um, letters, um, regulation surrounding licensure passes. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take a moment to celebrate. <laughs> um, lots of work. Kelly, thank you for, I don't know if it's your for former department, um, for all the work that they have done. Um, Alex, thank you. Um, ooh, it is it is done. Um, so on our agenda, we had that, we sort of kind of had this break. We are ahead of schedule here. Um, in terms of what we have left on our agenda for today, uh, just the regulation implementation process and what happens next, items for next meeting, and then our adjournment. Do we want to take another short break? Because it's 1125. I know we're scheduled to go to two. It, do we want to take another like short break, come back and do these items? Or is does the board just want to kind of keep going and finish up our meeting? What is the pleasure? I say keep going, but I'll, I'll do whatever people want to do. I feel the same. Keep it's going. 30, mi 30 minutes. Yes. Yes. Keep going. <laughs> All right, so Kelly, I think we're good to keep going. Um, we just never know with these meetings. Like we plan for a longer meeting just in case we have more discussion and we're in a good place. But I will ask Kelly, um, Kelly, do you feel like you need a break? Cause you've been doing a lot of talking. Um, do you, if, and we will respect that and give you grace if you would like to take a break. I appreciate that. I I ran to the restroom during our three minute break. So I'm good um, mm -hmm. for now. Um, I'm I'm happy to keep going. Okay. Don't, don't bang the desk. <laughs> All right. So what happened? So we've um motions, both motions uh were carried or motions to approve to adopt both 13A12 and 13A0706 would deal with um programs and licensure. And so now what happens next? Correct. So is that my segue? That's your, that was your segue. Okay. All right, let me share my screen again. All right, so I tried to give you um, a graphic because you tend to like them. Um, so we have been, I didn't go, I didn't go back in time, um, but we have at the department in this division specifically been working for, for, for months um, in preparation for this eventuality. So, so in a very high level, um, you know, we've been preparing um, for a variety of technical assistance um, 
So if you take a look at to January, so so given that this board has just adopted in November, um, it is anticipated that these regulations will go before the State Board of Education during their December meeting. They do not have a November meeting. They have an early December meeting each year. So I think it's the fifth or something close to that. So if uh, if all goes as planned, these regulations would go in front of the state board in December. Um, just as a reminder um, on the promulgation process for these regulations for our new board members, um, the State Board of Education and the Professional Standards Board have um equal say in regulations pertaining to educator certification slash licensure and preparation. So what that means is if the State Board of Education, after reviewing the public comment and having their discussion, decides that they want to make a substantive change um, to either set of these regulations, that set of regulations would begin the promulgation process again, meaning that it would come back to this board in January to look at those changes. And then if you voted to publish, then it would go back to the register. So that's those are the that's one potential pathway that this this takes from here. Um, the second pathway is that the state board um, adopts as this board just has. And then in that case, um, we kind of see where this is going, right? So regardless of the timing, you can think of this as as high level. This is what will happen regardless of it's in January or February or March or, or whenever the regulations do end up being adopted. So the first thing that needs to happen in um, gearing up for the regs to become effective, and again, we never anticipated that these regs would become effective the day that they're adopted or the day after they're adopted. Um, there's a lot of technical assistance that needs to happen and that's twofold. It needs to be provided to our educator preparation program so that they are very clear about what these regulations say. Um, although you all have been following this, I'm guessing that our colleagues aren't reading this at night before bed, um, and, and I know that they're busy, so they may not have the opportunity to watch all of our meetings. Um, so, you know, it's our job to make sure that they're informed, and so education is the key. And that goes for the educator preparation programs, but also our local education agencies. So so all there are several constituents um, that need to be um, educated about what this language is and, and, and what it means for that particular group and how it will look in practice. So that you're gonna see a variety of training delivered. Um, and that is gonna run from, you know, in-person, you know, traditional presentations. Okay, let's pick apart each regulation and go through and make sure you know exactly what's required um, to publications such as, you know, frequently asked questions or manuals rubrics, that kind of thing. Um, example scenarios, our LEAs love example scenarios. Um, you know, what do you do when you get this candidate that comes in the door? You know, how do you identify what pathway to licensure um, they need to go through, that kind of thing. Um, you know, getting into the nitty gritty of what that could look like. Um, we're also gonna have to release some transition policies. So one of the transition policies that we've talked about um, at this board specifically is, you know, what do we do with those individuals who are in mid cycle? They have a professional certificate and they did what they needed to do to renew it. And now they're going to be up for renewal. Um, and, and by the time that they renew, there's going to be these new regulations. So we have already, we have a, a, a policy, it's drafted, it's ready to go. Um, and basically what it says is, um, you know, we will give you a full validity period. So, for instance, if and I, I can I can use myself. So, I think the last time I I think I'm I'm due for renewal in 2025, I believe. So, I will be in that scenario where I started off my validity period, my five year validity period, under one set of renewal regulations, and then I'm ending it with another. So, so what what do I have to do? And the answer is I can do either. So, I can either just do what I started. Uh, or if it's easier for me um, and it makes more sense, I can transition to the new requirements. We'll accept either um, and we'll give each person that full validity period. So if I renew in 25, let's say I choose to just do the old way. I already took my six credits. Um, I'm going to do my two courses. I'm going to submit it in 2025. I get renewed. Now I need 
to implement the new regulations. So when I'm due again in 2030, I will have had to do everything in the new regulations for renewal. So that is how we anticipate our renewal transition policy working. Um, again, it's ready to go. It's something we will have to educate our LEAs and our and the public on. This is something that will have to be on our website. It will have to be public facing. Um, there are things like updating our teach application system. You know, we're already, we've already identified, okay, what licenses do we need to add? Are there any new workflows that we need to add? You know, what drop downs do we need to change to, to accommodate all these new renewal um, opportunities? So those are the things that we've already identified and we will need to work behind the scenes to make sure that that information is updated and ready to go. Um, so that's just a kind of a snapshot of, of, you know, where we anticipate um, doing in January, you know, that first month after adoption. Um, it's things that we've already started developing, but we, we're not going to implement until both boards have adopted. That's the beginning, right? You can't do it all in a month. Um, this is a massive undertaking. So we anticipate for many months after that, there will be continued technical assistance. Um, there will be new players that come on and get hired in LEAs and EPPs, and they'll need that information as well. Um, there'll be individuals that already got that information, but then they've, you know, they have new questions. So uh, another round of technical assistance and guidance. And I can see for this particular rollout, um, there's going to be a, a, a need for a lot of documentation. People are going to need to be able to reference something in writing instead of um, relying on, you know, calling the MSDE. We don't want you to have to rely on calling us. Um, so making sure that we're putting together the documentation that each constituent needs. Um, we need to alert all of our educators. Not all of them are employed. You know, it's easier to alert the ones that are employed because we can partner with our LEAs to get that communication out. But we need to get it out to the public, too. So we can do that um, using our teach system. We do have the ability to email all of our certificate holders um, through social media, through news releases, through our website. Um, there's a variety of things that we will do to try to get this information out as soon as we can. Um what else? So this is what I was talking a little bit about earlier. Um, you can see that it says March slash April 2024. Um, we have not discussed yet effective dates. I know like a while ago when we thought we were going to get this done in the summer, we were we were thinking January 1, 2024. Um, it's November 2nd. I, I don't know if that is a, is a reasonable expectation. To, to have these become effective in, in January. Now, I could see maybe our educator preparation partners wanting their regulations to become effective sooner because they need those regulations in order to um, you know, decide whether they want national versus state approval for us to work with MHEC in order to um, establish how we recognize those accrediting bodies. Um, so some things to consider. Um, but for the licensure regulation specifically, it is a tremendous amount of change. Um, and I and I don't know if one month or two months is reasonable to have it to have it all situated. Um, I was thinking more of a March, April 2024. We're in the middle of um, our busiest time is July 1st because that is not only when LEAs are hiring, but it's also when most people are due for renewal. So we don't want to throw it in the right then. That would be, that would make their minds explode. So um, so we'd want to back it up a little and make it um, probably in, in the early spring is what I would suggest. Um, but again, once they do become effective, the technical assistance and training cannot stop. It's going to just have to be an ongoing thing for for years, I would think, um, if not forever. So this is, again, just trying to give you a high level um, overview of, of what we're planning, what we're thinking. Um, and I'm and I'm happy to hear any feedback that you might have. Um, Dr. Garland and then um, Ms. Bobbitt. Thank you. So we're talking with this slide. This is great that you anticipated this discussion. With this, we're talking about the two sets of regs that we just um, the piston just uh, said that we would adopt. Correct, both sets. Yep. So then this will go to the state board in December. That's the plan. 
Yeah. So I've already received feedback from um, folks who I represent that the timeline is um, a short turnaround. Now, I'm not sure that. Uh, so I'm suggesting, oh, did you say we were going to talk about this next month to revisit this? Because you had said earlier that we really could have a better, a more in-depth discussion about when everything is implemented. Um, I think that this board can can certainly have that conversation now. If there are thoughts about, um, you know, how many months would be appropriate to recommend um, that it becomes effective, then I would love to hear it. Okay, okay I'm gonna I'm gonna go back with some emails that I received, but I do remember um, feedback saying that six to nine months is too soon. Correct. Six to nine months, that's probably not going to happen. And we don't technically, um, and we don't typically, excuse me, um, adopt regulations and say they're going to be, you know, in a year or nine months or six months. I, that would be unusual. You're saying it would be quicker? I'm saying it would be quicker. Um, might we be able to go back to all of our groups uh, homework? to um, check in with them and come back in for our December discussion um, so that we let can- see, Let me see if this might help. Cause I'm, I let me, let's pull apart the regulations for a second and just talk about program approval. And I probably should have mentioned this proactively. So I apologize. So, and I feel like we've talked about this before but let me be explicit. It's not the expectation that these regulations become effective and every EPP is in compliance, okay? It's not going to work that way. We will have to systematically roll out targeted visits and we will choose priorities. So for instance, and I'm not saying this is the way it's gonna be, it's a potential for the way it could look. Let's say that MSDE decides that once these become effective, let's say they become effective in April 2024, that we would be alerting our EPPs in December, if, if adopted, that, you know, starting in, let's say, June of 2024, we're going to be doing targeted site visits to look specifically at literacy making sure that the courses are being updated or are already aligned with the new literacy competencies. So choosing a priority. We also have to schedule because there are 22 traditional providers alone, right? And we've got, I think like 11, 12, 13 alternative providers. We can't monitor them all at once. So we're going to have to publish a schedule of visits. So I don't want the message to be they have to be in compliance because that is that's not the expectation. The expectation is we're going to publish a schedule and we're going to work with EPPs to make sure they understand what they need to do. And then we're going to go out systematically and we're going to monitor based on that published schedule. I don't know if that helps you. Uh, yes, I found the email. Can I just read the one sentence then? Um, so it says, if the revisions require programmatic changes, which we anticipate they might, that can take six to nine months to go through the approval process, four months on campus, and two to three months with MS, um, USM, and M House. I get so that. that. No, I, we get that but the regulations have to be effective in order to say, you've got to do this. So you're saying there, there wouldn't be sanctions if there's been documentation that an IHG program is working towards compliance? No, I mean, I'm not gonna say that because I, <laughs> That would be inappropriate for me to say. Um, when the regulations become effective, we will certainly work with our EPP partners. We will work with MHEC uh, to publish a schedule, to get feedback, um, but we cannot start that process until we have regulations. We cannot say to an EPP, you have to align with this if there's nothing in code to say that they do. 
And the one thing, I, and again, I'm I'm just talking here, and it's it's certainly not my uh, decision alone. So take everything I say with a grain of salt. But you know, there's a there is a law that's been in effect since February 2021. I would think one of the first priorities would be to ensure that our EPPs are in alignment with the statute that's already effective. That could potentially be another way to kind of address it in the interim while we are waiting to do these full visits that are going to take years in order to cover all of those full visits. So um, it, I don't think it would be appropriate to say, you know, they're going to become effective in nine months. That's my opinion. Miss, I think, was Miss Bob, I think Miss Bobbitt was next, then Miss Bacon, and then uh, Mr. Dr. Zebley. Well, my question is in reference to the TEACH portal. Um, so my question is very specific. If I uh, need to be redirected elsewhere, I understand. But I am working with an early career dance teacher who is seeking initial certification. She has access to her TEACH portal. Her application was denied. She was directed to look at the information on TEACH portal I guess that's supposed to explain why her certificate was denied, but we were not able to locate that. Um, additionally, on the MSDE website, there is no praxis identified for a dance educator. So I wanted to know what does she need to complete to work towards standard professional certification? Sure. And, by and you're right. There is no practice uh, content for dance. So Tamara DeShield Burns, the um, certification managers on this call, um, I'm going to assume that she heard everything you just said, and she's going to have someone get in touch with you and that candidate. That candidate will have to be a part of that conversation. So Tamara will reach out to you, Miss Bobbitt. Thank you. Miss Bacon? Um, so in terms of implementation, is there a scenario where the State Board of Ed uh, does not uh, concurrently adopt the new regulations and we go back to uh, revision and opening the vote again? Yes, absolutely. Yes. So so they could flat out um, oppose, which I don't think they would do. I think they would probably um, make substantive changes. I think that's much more likely. Um, so if any substantive changes are made to either one set or both, um, we would start the promulgation process over for those regulations. Yes. Did that answer your question, Ms. Bacon? Yes, thank you. Uh -huh. Dr. Zemley? Thanks so much. Um, I think that my comment is specifically in regards to timeline with the licensure regulation. Um, formerly working with teachers who are new to the profession and really uh, trying to maintain their certification or, or uh, get their first full certification, I think the sooner the better. I, I would be in favor of a March 1 deadline because we've been waiting years uh, for folks to say, you know, we've been saying for years, they're changing, they're changing. Just wait, wait till they're adopted. Uh, and I would, would think that March 1, the sooner we can uh, make these regulations effective, I think the better for folks so they know exactly what to do. Thank you. Miss Bobbitt, is that a new, is that an additional question or you? No, sorry. That's okay. All right. Any additional questions or comments in terms of implementation, the implementation timeline? All right, items for our, well, I think we're ready to move on. Items for our next meeting. Melita, um, I, I didn't explicitly put it on the um, agenda, but I also provided the draft calendar. Just wanted to make sure that everybody saw that. Um, it's what we discussed, but if you need me to change anything, just let me know. Otherwise, I'll get it up on the website. I'll build the page. I saw it, um, but let me just edit one more time.
Um, any questions um, with the calendar? I know we talked about the inclement weather days. I don't know if that was last month or September. Um, and we moved the September meeting so that it's the second Thursday. And we moved- Last month, Melita, that we discussed this. Th thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. Um, and we moved the September meeting to make it the second Thursday in September. And we moved the November meeting to make it the second Thursday in September. Um, were there any questions or concerns? This is just a hard copy because I'm pretty sure we um, we approved the calendar already. Yep, so if it looks good, I'll remove the watermark mm -hmm. and I'll send it out. I know that some of you need it for your your sub, your substitutes. Yep. And then our items for our December meeting. So may I ask, sorry, I wasn't quick on the unmute. Are we, uh, we're meeting virtually today because there's a healthy number of us, which is fabulous. Are we returning to MSC? Have they found any room at the end? Well, I was going to, I was going to um, ask Kelly that um, before we kind of went over the items and then kind of, we don't know. Um, but I did notice at the last meeting that if everybody was present, we would not fit. And so we loosely talked about it and one of the reasons uh, for us being virtual today was to make sure that everyone was comfortable. Um, I didn't like the idea of someone sitting in the audience if they needed to have a seat at the table with the board. So this kind of gave MSDE a little bit more time to kind of figure out the logistics of where we could meet in the building and the spacing. So we'll start with that. So Kelly, do we have a space or do we need to make any changes to the meeting just because of the availability of the space? So we do have a space that that will accommodate everybody. It's um it's our largest conference room on um floor eight, and it's certainly big enough. Um, I'll pull up my calendar in just a second. What we do need to do is ensure that it is available um, on our scheduled dates, and if not, hope that we can kick out whoever is scheduled. They are depending on what they what they have it scheduled for. Um, so we're in the process of doing that. So the long and short of it is we have a space. Um, we have to work with our um, company that does the recording on how exactly that's going to work. Um, but as of now, let's plan on being in that conference room. If for some reason we run into a snag for any of the months, um, Melita, I will be reaching out directly to you. Okay. All right, so that answers our question. We'll double check. And so at the latest for our notification, if we're gonna to switch to virtual, Kelly, would it be feasible to say December 1st, Friday, December 1st, if we need to switch to virtual, is that is that fair? Sure. Okay. So if we're going to need to switch over to virtual, we'll uh, you'll get an email just basically saying by Friday, December first, that we're going to need to be virtual. And so the decision to go virtual is probably just based. It's going to be based solely on just the space. Um, if some odd reason we can't get that room, other than that, we'll be moving to the eighth floor. And I'm sure when the materials are sent out, that uh, that information will be included in there. Um, Miss Bacon. Um, would either the in-person or virtual still be the 9.30 start or the 9 a.m.? If we're going to be in-person, it's 9.30. We're usually 9.30. This was a, an anomaly. It was just because we were going to be virtual. It, it just, we could be a little earlier because we didn't have travel time. Um, but definitely 9.30 because I have that pint-sized human in the bus. <laughs> so 9.30 is just a little bit, uh easier. So it would be our normal time of our 930 time. Once we get through the items that we need to discuss in December, we will probably have a better idea of an end time. Um, and just trying to be forward thinking in September made this meeting a little bit longer just in case we needed more time to discuss everything. Item
times for next meeting. So, uh, Kelly, when we meet next, will that be after the state board meeting? Yes, two days after. So it won't necessarily be a state board update, probably more of a, a highlight if necessary, just for two days turnaround. Well, hopefully I'll have a very big update. Okay. I can share that. <clears throat> so we'll have our state board update. Um, what else do we, because we've gotten through these regulations, What what's next? Melita, will you have a communication update? We will. I definitely will have a communication update for December. Um, also, I'm going to ask that the subcommittee be able to come back and share the letter with us in December as well. So that was going to be my question, Melita. This is Joy Spain. Um, do we have an idea, the subcommittee, of, of when we want to gather? Do we have a kind of a date in mind just because I'm, no, I'm, I'm thinking out. what's going to probably happen next is that a, a doodle poll will have to go out um, just so that, you know, you have to kind of correspond with people's schedule to figure out when everyone can meet virtually. Um, and then once that goes into play, I think, I, I don't know if it's going to take one session or two sessions to draft um, the letter, but if we're meeting December, I don't have my December calendar up. I'm sorry. If we're meeting December 7th, um, that should be plenty of time um, for the committee to come back, even with the holidays um, in there. That should be plenty of time for the subcommittee to get together, draft it, and have something to bring back to us. Uh, Sandy? Yeah, I'm thinking, I mean, I'm not on that committee, but <clears throat> I'm thinking about the legislative process. And if you wait till January to get that information to the legislators, it's going to be really hard for them to like offer any kind of like write up an amendment or something. So I don't know. I think that timeline's going to make it really tight for them. That's what I was thinking, Sandy. That's where yeah. I was going with it, trying to meet as soon as possible. I, I get yeah, the that's what I was going to say. It should be like as soon as possible um, to to come together to meet. Just the sooner the better. Um, and so I feel like in the past, and Darren, correct me if I'm wrong, because I, I, I participated in a subcommittee before, I do believe that the information was sent out, I think, on the decision from the subcommittee. I don't think that we came back and voted on it. But it's actually, not actually, I was on the subcommittee for a couple of things, and we did work, but then we brought it back and had to have an official vote on whether the rest of this did agree on to it. So that's why I mean, it's gotta, it's gotta be rather quickly. We do have the holidays this month and to kind of come back so that we can get it to whoever it needs to, I wanna say whoever, but get it to the appropriate people rather quickly um, so that if they are going to make some changes within the legislative session, it can be done. So we have to move rather quickly. Yeah, yeah, my point is that I think it has to be, and Sean can tell us, I think it has to be voted on as a at a open fisted meeting though. So we would be able to vote. Oh, you have a subcommittee. The chair does have the um privilege to write things on behalf of the board and send them out without them coming back. We do we did vote on that um from a previous chair that the chair does have the flexibility as chair to right on behalf um, as officially a representation for the board, but because the nature of this letter, Sean, what would be the, um, where, uh, how would how would we proceed with this? Because I know as chair, I can write a letter and it does not need to come back to the board for a vote, um, but it is often shared with the board. But because we have a subcommittee, um, we need to, it needs to come back to the group to be voted on and then it would be pushed out officially from the chair or I think you can do it either way. I mean, I, so the, the, there's, there's two kind of differing things we're talking about here, right? One is just a general, the, the, the chair has the ability to always write the exercise kind of those administrative functions of the board. One of those being to write a letter on behalf of the board 
you know, describing, you know, the chair's position. But if, if you want, uh, if you want a position of, of the board as a whole, if you, if you want to demonstrate, for example, that this is a, a measure the board is taking, you certainly are prohibited from voting on the issue and saying, you know, as, as this is something that the board feels as a whole is appropriate, but you don't need to do so. Again, the, the board has, the chair has the ability on behalf of the board to exercise some of those administrative functions like writing letters. So um, I hope that answers your question that you don't necessarily need to take a vote on the issue, um, even with the subcommittee. I mean, you're, we're dealing with less than a quorum uh, in the subcommittee, from my understanding as well, with it being seven. So um, I, I don't think there's, uh, from my kind of preliminary research, I don't think there's necessarily open meetings issues with it. I don't think there's necessarily any kind of issue with the chair writing the letter to the board or writing writing the letter to the legislature. Um, so. Um, Ms. Yoho. Thank you. Just a question, which my mind was running as Sean was talking, um, because we talked about sending this to the state board and it only seems that that needs to go to their December meeting because they won't meet again until I assume the end of January and then sessions really already well underway. And then how will they have knowledge of that? And so I was kind of running through if the subcommittee could meet ASAP and get you a letter that they vote on, if you can send a letter on the behalf and however you want to word that with the process, then you could get, get it all going a little sooner because um, people that have said you need to do this ASAP, they are absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. To be clear, I, I don't think the state board will discuss this in a meeting. I think that they'll do it all behind the scenes. I don't, they don't typically have these discussions. I, I was thinking the same thing, um, Kelly. I thought that it was going to be a behind the scenes discussion. So, but either way with the next meeting, whatever communication will be shared, it may not necessarily be voted on, but you will at least be able to see what communication went out and what was shared with the state board. Kelly, what other items do we have next month? Uh, I have a note and I don't know if, if what we just talked about kind of is the end of it, but to talk about legislative priorities. So I don't know if there are additional priorities this board wanted to discuss or if if the one that we've talked about today is, is it. If that is it, then I wouldn't recommend an agenda item. But if you think that there are other priorities that you want to identify, then I would suggest having the, the that agenda item in December. Okay. Um, offhand, I, I don't know if when we talked about that, that this was going to be the priority or if we had something else. I'm going to lean on Darren here. I don't remember when we talked about that, if this potential letter was going to be the priority, because we're talking about a couple of months ago, probably, or if we have, if there were some other items. Well, I think we left it open so that, you know, if we needed others, we could. At this point, I don't see any others. Kelly, I was wondering also, um, is it too early for you to begin to think about creating the list for phase two of where we might want to start, what the priorities would be and so forth, with the assumption that, you know, the state board would vote, yes, we're ready to go? No, not at all. Okay, so that might be something uh, to present at the next meeting as well. Darren, what did you just say? It went out a little bit on my end. He said, Oh, something. I'm sorry. Uh, I was asking for Kelly to maybe bring back a list of priority items for phase two. Okay. All right. So for our December meeting, um, I have our uh, items that we would typically have, which would be our call to order public count of. Uh, public comment, state board update, um, any announcements, communication update, um, approval of the November meeting minutes, um, legislative priorities, um, as well as like the priority items for phase two, because we're going to start moving into phase two. And so just having those items. Anything that I'm missing for the agenda for December? 
um, looking at the items that we have, I think we could very well be finished by 12. Kelly, you think we need more than that? I'm thinking we can be finished by 12 o'clock. Okay, 9.30 to 12? Yeah, I think we can be finished by 12 o'clock. I mean, unless the discussion is super robust, um, I don't know, we'll see. Anything, oh wait, we need to, um, motion to approve the items for the uh, agenda. So moved, this is Dr. Taylor. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I probably could have said without objection, <laughs> the agenda, I'm sorry, let me recap here. Um, I feel like I get a lot more fatigue when we're on the computer. Um, without objection, motion to approve the December meeting agenda with the items that were discussed. Seeing no objection, the items for the December meeting meeting are approved as stated. Dr. Gartland? Thank you. So I have a question, Kelly. So if, if the state board takes these up, the legs up in December, does it then go to the AIB? So the How AIB, they come into play? So the AIB has weighed in. You know, they sent us a formal letter. So I, I don't anticipate any holdup from the AIB, but I'm not the AIB. Um, so certainly they they have the authority to um, intervene, um, I would think. It's all, we're learning all of this, um, you know, for the first time. Um, I don't anticipate that, but it, it's, I believe it's a possibility. Darren? Oh, I was just thinking since we have um, all the subcommittee members here, um, maybe it would be advantageous if they stay on after the meeting ends just for a few minutes and we could actually talk about when we could potentially meet at the beginning maybe of next week. That might be a little easier than doing a poll. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great idea. Sean, there's no problem with us staying on after the meeting, right? Uh, sorry, I just want to make sure I wasn't muted. No, there's not. Um, and especially if you're just up, all you're doing is is working to schedule the discussion regarding the for or for the subcommittee. I don't think that's an issue. Okay, Melita, do you want to do that? Sure, that sounds great. Okay, sounds good. All right. Without objection, um, we're going to officially adjourn the meeting at twelve o five p.m. No objection. Meeting is officially over at 12.05. Thank you. Dylan, are you still with us? Bye, everybody. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> Thank you. Happy holidays. So Kelly, do we need to get Dylan? Yeah, they're going to stay on and have a subcommittee meeting, and I don't want it streamed. Okay, hold on. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your patience, guys.
Kelly, I have a call in to Dylan. He should be coming on momentarily to stop live streaming the meeting, okay? Okay. Thank I'll, you. I'll make sure I keep a double check on that. Thank you.